Live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City, I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. We've got your morning rundown here, so let's get to some of the top stories of the day. First off, taking a look at Disney, Disney's trajectory is still very much in question. We heard from CEO Bob Iger. He has a plan to tip the scales. He's trimming costs by an additional $2 billion after cutting thousands of jobs this year. Now, more good news for the media giant came with a tentative deal ending the actor strike. Iger saying that he's, quote, elated, but his Cost cutting enough to revive a stock trading at the lowest level in nearly 10 years. Plus, tech trouble overseas. Apple may still be on the hook for a $14 billion tax bill in Ireland. Could an EU court revisit an earlier ruling that said it wasn't liable? Meanwhile, chipmaker NVIDIA reportedly has a plan to reach the China market. U.S. restrictions be damned. It's developing three new chips that will skirt the latest export rules from D.C. That's according to local media. And Delta's fight plan, we are sitting down with the CEO, Ed Bastian, for the latest on the airline's crucial holiday travel season. In last quarter's earnings, Delta forecasted solid demand to continue through the end of the year. But rising fuel prices put pressure on margins and also saw Delta lower its free cash flow and earnings forecast. But we got to start today with this morning's driver, and that is the House of Mouse. Disney's cost-cutting campaign is in full swing after CEO Bob Iger raised its target to seven and a half billion dollars trimming costs by an additional two billion. Now, Iger's plan to turn a profit by the end of 2024 has resulted in slashing thousands of jobs this year and also lowering costs on content spend. But analysts, they want to know, are these cost cuts enough to save a stock trading from its current nine year lows? And Brad, you and I have talked about this so many times when it comes to the troubles, the challenges right now here for Disney. The stock has been under tremendous amount of pressure, yet you're seeing some gain here in pre-market trading up just about 4%. Now, analysts were very encouraged by some of the commentary coming out from Iger. When it comes to the bold cost cuts, I think this is also one of the uh, real starting points where we see Iger's strategy really starting to take shape. We know that he has uh, gone on the offensive, trying to slash costs every way he can. Still, though, the streaming business is unprofitable. Yes, losses have narrowed, but I think the investment thesis and the big question out there from the street is what exactly that growth opportunity looks like and how sustainable that is. It's such a big question, and it's a multi-pronged business that we have to remember with Disney every single quarter here with that parks and resorts massive business that they have and international, especially with the different type of demand environments that they have to navigate through. So you've got the consumer on one end in the experiences. You have the consumer on the other end with the streaming and entertainment side. And that's particularly where it's interesting what they were talking about on the call that really restructuring of the company, enabling tremendous efficiencies on track to achieve roughly $7.5 billion in cost reductions, $2 billion more than targeted earlier this year, as you were noting. But they're also saying that this is helping improve the operating results of the combined streaming businesses by about $1.4 billion fiscal year over fiscal year. Confident that they're going to achieve that profitability, though, in Q4 of fiscal 2024. Oh, yeah, by the way, since we're coming up on the holiday season, I might as well mention the merchandise business, too, here because that is significant when you're talking about putting little plush Mickey and Minis in people's homes as well. It certainly is. We know that this is so critical. We talk about the fact that people are still spending in some aspects, a lot of that on the experience, but the parks business, lots yeah. of questions there just in terms of the CapEx spend that Disney is planning. We know that they laid out those plans during Investor Day, but what exactly that looks like mm -hmm. going forward. We're going to be talking to an analyst here in just a minute about what he sees there. But ESPN going back there because we talked about that. It came up a couple of times. Ali Canal, who we're going to talk to here in a second. Ask Kevin Mayer just about the future of the business, exactly what that looks like, the appetite, how much people are willing to spend on content, specifically on sports content. And we take a look at these numbers, generated operating income, $953 million in the quarter, up about 15% compared to the prior year. A lot of that was driven by the business here domestically, but we know that's also a focal point here for analysts. Yes, yeah, spot on. So let's go to our own Ali Canal, who has been standing by, and, and particularly here, Ali, there's so much to continue to break down with Disney, first and foremost, let's talk about what we're seeing and hearing from a lot of those activist campaigns as well that have initiated and where things are set to move forward from here. 
Yeah, it certainly hasn't been an easy road for CEO Bob Iger since he stepped back into the position nearly one year ago. He did briefly speak about the activist fight in an interview with CNBC following the earnings announcement. He said he's had a call with Nelson Peltz, but ultimately he doesn't know what exactly the activist investor wants. But he did address the falling stock price. You mentioned the stock is at nine-year lows. Shares are currently down about 3% year to date. They've fallen nearly 8% since Iger has taken over as CEO. CEO. The executive said, quote, uh, I we don't manage the stock price for short term gains or on a short term basis. We have a long term view. And this past year has been spent fixing things that needed to be addressed. The long term picture for Disney shareholders is quite bright. And these were sentiments that were echoed at our Yahoo Finance and Best Conference on Tuesday. Like Shauna said, I had the chance to speak with Kevin Mayer. He's a former head of streaming for Disney. He currently serves as co-CEO of his company, Candle Media, as well as serving as an, an advisor to Iger. I asked him specifically how one can manage a company when the stock is struggling, when you're fending off all of these activist fights. How do you make long-term decisions when you're dealing with all of these short-term problems? Here's a bit more of what he had to say. Bob has his hands full, I, I, gotta, I gotta say. But you take someone like Bob, he's very capable, he's multifaceted, he can, he can, you know, he has a lot of range so he can handle it. Not everyone could handle a situation like that. But I think you have to be disciplined and Bob's always been very strategic. So um, when we did M&A, we were very much about, let's look at the strategy, let's look at the context, look, look at where we want this company to be, and then look at what assets can plug in there to get us there. And that's a strategy Iger is certainly focused on right now in the earnings release. He said there are four pillars the company is really emphasizing moving forward. One is streaming profitability, which you guys mentioned they are on track to hit at the end of fiscal 2024. Another is ESPN's transition to direct to consumer, along with growth in the parks business and more output on the film studio side. Uh, you said earlier that Disney has already upped that cost cutting goal by $2 billion to $7.5 billion free cash flow is expected to hit eight billion in fiscal 2024. Disney Plus added a whopping seven million subscribers in the quarter. So all in all, this was very strong. And I'm guessing Nelson Peltz is going to be encouraged by the results that we saw yesterday. Ali, I'm curious to get your take on the ending here of the actor strike, just how much of an impact that has had at Disney and now potentially here with this resolved, what that could do for Disney's business in the current quarters or in the coming quarters, excuse me. No, it's it's huge, really, for all of the studios. And there's been pressure on both sides. I mean, this strike has lasted 118 days. We finally have a deal. And judging from the commentary that we've gotten so far from the union, it seems like the union was able to get a lot of their requests, especially when it comes to protection surrounding AI. We know that there is some sort of streaming uh, compensation included in that. We won't see the specific, sp excuse me, specifics of this deal until it goes to the board on Friday, but it comes at a critical time. I mean, especially if you think about this all going to plan, we still have a chance to save the broadcast season. We still have a chance to save the 2024 summer box office season. And that I think was a critical part for Disney, really for all of these studios. Once you start shifting around the theatrical release schedule, that's going to create some headwinds. But we also have to remember that there's also been a lot of pain on this side. Uh, both of those strikes, the writers included estimated to have cost the LA economy more than $6.5 billion and 45,000 jobs in the entertainment industry. So there's been a lot of pain, but hopefully now Hollywood can get back to work. And Disney, along with many others in Hollywood, is very happy about that. Certainly. All right, Ali Canal, great stuff. Thanks so much for breaking all of that down. Let's talk. take a look specifically at the parks business when it comes to Disney. Disney's theme parks have typically been reliable cash engines for the company as families save all year to spend days on rides and meeting characters. But recent price hikes could prove to be a challenge for consumers while wage inflation weighs on the company. CEO Bob Iger mentioning the company's intention to turbocharge growth in the experiences business on the fourth quarter earnings call. Most of the focus for the conversation was on bringing profitability to streaming. So are parks still the savior of Disney's business? We want to bring in Doug Kreutz. He's T.D. Cowan, Managing Director of Media and Entertainment. Doug, it's great to see you here. So let's talk about the parks business. What's your assessment just on their ability here to maintain the returns that they've seen in parks while also scaling and investing with the goals that they recently laid out at their investor day, $60 billion. 
Yeah, the, the parks is the part of the business that people don't really worry about. It's a, it's an incredibly profitable business for them. Uh, they've grown it by investing in the parks business for for you know since basically Iger came in the first time back in 04, 05. Uh, and they talked about investing twice as much over the next 10 years as they invested over the past 10 years. I think it makes sense. Uh, it's a business they should continue to invest in. The question is, can you scale the size of your investment while maintaining the same level of returns? And that can be difficult to do. I mean, they, they've sort of admitted that on the content side, they they went for quantity over quality and it didn't work out as well as they would have liked. I don't, I don't really think that's any different when it comes to investing capital that the more you need to invest, the harder it is for that marginal dollar to generate returns. Doesn't mean they can't do it, but it, it will be a challenge. Even if they do do it, uh, we did an analysis that suggested that their investment, that they're planning could drive high single digit EBIT growth over the next 10 years in the segment. Now that's good, don't get me wrong, um, but I don't know that it's so good that it really changes anybody's view on how good the parks business overall. Is this, is this purely looking at the acreage that they have and saying that we need to develop more on top of that? Or is this an expansion into new regions that you're anticipating? It, it's multifaceted. It's, it's building out on the acreage they have. And at their uh, an analyst day in September, they, they talked a lot about how they have a lot more acreage available than people might realize at, at most of their parks. Uh, it's things like the cruise lines. They're going to be launching several new ships over the next few years. The cruise lines have been a, a great investment for them. Um, they've got they've got their Disney vacation uh, ho hotels, and and I do think that ultimately you probably will see some new park footprints crop up uh, in strategic locations, uh, probably towards the end of the ten year period. But that that probably is somewhere that they will head eventually. So let's focus on the streaming side of things because the streaming business obviously still unprofitable, although losses did narrow just a bit. When you take a look at Disney's goal, obviously they're doing all they can to really grow their returns here for streaming going forward. How sustainable is that? And I guess, what do you see that upside looking like? Yeah, so it's a, it's a multi multifaceted problem, right? Essentially what Disney's doing, and, and this is a little blunt, but they're making the service worse by producing less content for it and raising price. And they're not the only ones that are doing that. All of the streaming services are doing that. Um, you know, th these services have been underpriced and, and overserved with content early and th that's being corrected. But as a consumer, it doesn't necessarily make you feel great. Uh, so they're gonna get to profitability, right? There's no reason, honestly, that Disney Plus shouldn't be a profitable service given the the quality and the depth of the content that disney has uh the strong brand that disney has the question is how profitable can it be and at the same time what's going to happen to their linear business right the linear business which is under an enormous amount of pressure uh linear tv advertising remains incredibly weak uh we're seeing cord cutting we're continuing at sort of high dis single digit percentage annual rates um, if they get the linear business, to, if they get the DTC business to profitability, but the linear business is melting, the, the total profitability of the entertainment segment doesn't, doesn't necessarily go anywhere. So you know, they've talked about they're open to strategic options for their linear businesses. I think they're looking very closely at what they can do with certainly with ABC and the Fox networks and potentially with ESPN. Uh, but that doesn't mean anything's going to happen that's going to really them. Just, Doug, lastly, while we have you, I mean, when we talk about what that advertising business is going to mean in terms of the broader linear, I mean, we're going into an election season next year. Companies in the previous one, we knew that they were more kind of reticent or perhaps sitting back from investing as much in advertising as they would have because they were fearing the content that they would run up again. For Disney, it might be slightly different in some of that consideration, but at the same time, if we do see a pullback in advertising next year, what does that spell out for that linear business? Well, political is always additive to the advertising pie. Um, you know, uh, we're talking billions of dollars of advertising flowing from campaigns. Um, that does push out some of the sort of standard advertising. It's not fully additive, but the ad market should be better next year because of political. It's just, it's a cyclical thing, right? It's sort of, it's good one year and then it's less good the next. And that's been the case for a long time. It will continue to be the case. I don't think it really impacts Disney's structural challenges at all.
All right. Well noted. Doug Kreutz, who is the TD Cowan Managing Director of Media and Entertainment. Doug, appreciate the time and insights. Thanks for kicking off the show with us. Thank you. Certainly. Well, this week, Fed Chair Jay Powell's speech had investors holding their breath for signs of what's next for interest rates. Powell is set to speak again this afternoon, but it's not expected to announce any big decisions. Just this week, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq both hit their longest streak of gains in two years. For more on this, we've got Callie Cox, U.S. investment analyst at eToro. And Callie, let's begin things right there. What what really here is the catalyst for the extended gains that we had seen, especially in the S&P 500 and, and this win streak? Yeah, well, the headline catalyst is the Fed and what Powell said in uh, his post-meeting press conference last week, uh, basically pushing back on the fact that the Fed, you know, may institute one more hike without making any promises and talking about the balance of risks, you know, how inflation has made so much progress, but how they're also, you know, worried about the weakness we're seeing in the job market, uh, which to the Fed or to investors, excuse me, you know, might mean that the Fed could be flexible on policy. Kelly, we heard from uh, Jeffrey Gunlock uh, during y y YF Invest, our summit here uh, earlier this week. And our colleague Brian Sazi asked him just about the risk of recession, what stocks would potentially be under the most amount of pressure. He pointed to the fact that the Magnificent Seven could take a pretty substantial hit. What's your outlook on that? And I guess, are you right now avoiding some of that exposure? Yeah, we're actually leaning into that exposure. And of course, we don't manage money, but we're telling customers to think about quality risk. Now, I can't argue with the Bond King here. I mean, Jeff, of all people, probably has a better feeler on the economy than most of Wall Street. And I still think a recession is a risk. There's immense pressure on the economy right now. But you have to think about a few things, right? Uh, this recession risk or this recession worry has been in the market for so long that investors have had time to prepare for it. And I consider them you know, anxious and fearful at the moment. That's a good support for markets. Uh, but you have also have to watch the companies that you're investing in right now because interest rates are high. You know, Recessions are known for washing out the weak hands in the market. And Oh, you have to think about which companies are durable enough to survive a recession. When you think about that, I mean, it's hard to look past big tech. And where are the market's weak hands right now, then? So I would look at smaller speculative companies. So small caps have actually been catching a lot of attention. They're having the worst year relative to large caps since 1998. And that's for a reason. I mean, small caps are domestically focused, so they, they're hit by the double whammy of slowing growth and high interest rates because they're more sensitive to interest rate hikes. So you know, if you're a longer term investor and you're willing to look on a broader perspective, then small caps may be a good buy here. But, you know, if you're looking for opportunity over the next three to six months, I would probably veer toward that larger, you know, quality company risk instead of that, uh, you know, smaller, speculative, unprofitable risk. Kelly, you mentioned earlier here uh, this morning that the Fed could potentially be flexible on policy. More specifically, what do you mean by that? And I guess, is there a case to be built that maybe the Fed is actually done? I think there's definitely a case there. We've seen a lot of progress in inflation. Uh, Jay Powell knows that they've hiked quite a bit and they could probably achieve more if they keep rates higher for longer. And to be honest, you know, what will a 25 basis point hike here actually do other than, you know, shake market confidence at a time where the Fed wants to tread carefully? So, you know, we don't have a crystal ball. Nobody does. But we see a good case for the Fed being done here. And for now, that's good news for stocks because we're not seeing recessionary evidence elsewhere. Yeah, my crystal ball's in the shop right now, so I'm hoping they get that back to me <laughs> sometime soon here, Callie. You know, ultimately, as we kind of look into next year, where are you seeing investors place some of their top ideas? And, and perhaps what is the, the prevailing thought, even as we get into 2024, if the rate strategy that you were discussing holds true? Well, there's a trade behind this. Um, basically, everything that didn't work in 2022 when rates were rising could be back on the table for 2024. And we're already seeing that over the past eight days in this, you know, ridiculously fierce pull, uh, excuse me, sell off, not sell off, wow, <laughs> rally that we're seeing in markets right now. It's being driven by those rate sensitive sectors, tech, 
real estate, consumer staples, people were really caught off guard by the fact that, you know, yields rose so much. And then Jay Powell threw water on all of that. So we're looking at the rate sensitive sectors. We still have a bias toward those big quality companies. Uh, but most of all, we think that you can't give up on this market. It's a bull market until proven otherwise. All right, Callie Cox, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for taking the time this morning. U.S. Investment Analyst with eToro. Thanks, Callie. Well, Bitcoin is climbing higher today, hitting its highest level that we've seen in about 18 months, sitting just shy of 37,000 on renewed hopes of a spot Bitcoin ETF approval. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery standing by on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with the latest. Jared. Yes, uh, 37,000, really impressive. Let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive and talk about this uh, Grayscale Bitcoin, which is about to become an ETF. Uh, the SEC lost that court case, and there are a bunch of other spot B uh, ETFs, spot Bitcoin ETFs that are just waiting to come into the market uh, from BlackRock and a bunch of different ETF providers. So lots of hype surrounding that. And if we take a look at the chart, you can see 37,500 and change here. Uh, we have really accelerated off of this base here. So not not much was happening for a few months and then suddenly we got what uh, some people are calling a god candle that would be right here and now we're clearing resistance 35,000 was a big number now we're up to 37,000 let me just show you a three-year chart so we can see where uh, some of the price memory is we're really in the thick of it right now at the lower end down here but you can see tons of price memory all the way up to about 65 70,000 so uh, the short story is there's a long way to go but if Bitcoin is emerging finally from this crypto winter then there's lots of enthusiasm uh, behind it and uh, perhaps it can clear a lot of these major hurdles. Uh, it was only yesterday I was talking about uh, the, the FTX uh, perhaps rising from the ashes. There are a number of potential suitors there three of which um, are leading the negotiations, one of which is headed by Tom Farley, used to be the president of the New York Stock Exchange right here. But back to the Wi-Fi Interactive, let me just show you what's happened over the last three days so you can really appreciate uh, some of the outsized move that we've seen from some of the smaller tokens. FTT token, that's up 75%. Let me show you a one-year chart, and it kind of looks like a, a sinusoidal pattern here, periodic bouts of enthusiasm, uh, I guess not worried that it's going to go to zero at least. Uh, we've seen this play out over the last year, but if I put a three-year chart, you can really see the damage that was done to this token. It's basically down uh, over 90% over the last two years. There you go, 96, 97%. Uh, all told here, it's looking good for the risk markets, not just Bitcoin and crypto, which has been seeing a lot of love. Let me go to some of our leading uh, markets. Uh, if we go over the last three days, actually, let me pull it up for the last seven. That's going to take us back to, I believe, last Wednesday's Fed announcement, which really started the risk engine juice. ARK Invest is up 17.6%, cannabis up 12%, gambling up 10%. So this is really all about risk on, and crypto is just kind of participating, although it admittedly does have its own fundamentals here, guys. All right, Jared, stay with us for the opening bell. We're going to have much more from Jared on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, it is the season for travel. According to Deloitte's 2023 holiday travel survey, we can expect a busy one this year. 48% of Americans plan to travel over the holidays, up from 31% in 2022. And the trend upward can be seen across all age groups and incomes. We heard from one hospitality giant Marriott CEO, Anthony Capuano, at Yahoo Finance Invest on Tuesday. And he said the company expects traffic for leisure and business to be terrific this year. And now... We are going to hear from Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian to see if they're seeing the same thing at airports. Ed, great to have you here with us. Thank you for having me, Brad. Absolutely. I mean, let's talk about the year that has been. I mean, to this point, 2023 passenger throughput is 105 percent compared to 2019. So we're on track to see the first year where we replaced one of those pre-pandemic markers. How has that kind of passed through? What kind of bookings have you seen for the holiday season thus far? I think it's going to be a really busy uh, travel period. It's going to be a great travel period. We're ready for it. We've got our staff and technology and our, our airports are ready to, to handle the volumes. And I think it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time for people as they continue to invest in experiences. And how do those booking trends look going even into 2024? When you think about the holidays, that travel season, that's typically when everybody is saying, okay, got to go see grandma, got to go see my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, newborns as well. So how does that also transpire even after that? The bookings look good going into the new year. After the holidays, there's always a lull okay. in, in our business. You know, January through the first part of February is usually the, the, the quietest mm-hmm. period for travel. It, and, so, and then it picks up again with the President's Day weekend and spring break and then just runs right through Labor Day. So, but everything's looking good. What can customers expect to be different in that travel experience when we get into next year? Well, one of the things that everyone's experienced is, you know, the, the demand has outweighed the capabilities. And it doesn't matter whether it's in the airlines, the hotels, the restaurants. Uh, we're now fully ready, fully trained. We've got 35,000 new people that we've added to the company over the course of the last couple of years. And they're just ready to go. And I just give you a stat as to how ready we are at Delta. Yesterday, we operated 5,000 flights. We only had two cancellations the entire day and both due to weather and ran 90% on time. So the team's there, the team's ready to go, and people, when they they, uh, they get into the airports, are going to see uh, a, a great experience. And the other thing that's also interesting for a lot of people as they can come back to the skies is all the investment we've made in the airports themselves. Here in New York at LaGuardia or JFK or Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, Seattle, Boston, Beautiful new airports, beautiful new clubs, uh, great new technology, free Wi-Fi in Delta. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I want to come back to some of those perks just a little bit later, but you, you mentioned winter travel, too. This seems to be one of the more volatile parts of the year. And winter weather, we can't control it as much as we wish we could. What, what changes in operations does Delta become accustomed to making at this time of the year to make sure that you can still carry or tout that ranking as number one in on-time arrivals year to date? Well, one of the things we're proud of is that we are very much a North Northern tier airline, New York, Detroit, Minneapolis, Seattle, right across the northern tier. Those are all big hubs for Delta. And that's where we have a lot of people that understand de-icing, understand what it takes to operate in difficult uh, weather patterns and conditions. We've got all the de-icing fluid. We, we run plays to get ready uh, in advance of the winter season. So we're going to be ready. We're going to be ready. I want to talk about some of those recent financial results, too, here, because It seems like, and I was taking a look at the stock price, you know, even as we have about a month and change left in this year, it seems like investors are trying to get ahead of any normalization that we may see in next year. Is that something that is playing out in the booking trends, the numbers? Is there normalization that is perhaps possible in the airline industry once we get into 2024? Well, I think we're entering the period of the new normal for travel. I think the the big revenge travel, if that's what you want to refer to it as, sure. is, I would say it's behind us, but the big big pop is, is, is kind of come and gone. And now as you're looking at pricing, as you're looking at trends, you know, we're coming off of a peak last year where people just needed to go. They didn't really care where they what they paid or where they went. They just needed to get out. Uh, we're now back into more of a normalized pricing environment, but we still have a, a, a great outlook on, uh, on our revenue. Our, I expect our fourth quarter to be a record. Uh, for the company and both in revenues as well as in demand. In our industry, on the lower end of the pricing curve, Mm -hmm. there is some stress with with some of the low cost airlines and low fare airlines, 
but as a full service carrier, whether it's international, whether it's business, whether it's premium, we've got a very healthy mix of, of revenue streams that are all contributing to that record performance. You're, you're probably one of the only CEOs over the course of this earnings season that hasn't had to mention Manjaro or Ozempic on an earnings call, but you, ha you have had to at least consider the consumer demand environment right now and what some retailers perhaps have also had to consider too in, in student loan repayments and how that's impacted or at least that resumption is natural to think that some consumers' travel plans may be influenced. Is that starting to show up at all? It's not, we're not seeing it in our in our bookings. You know, on, on the margin, we're not seeing the the continued growth up, mm -hmm. but more of the stability in terms of where we've been for the last uh, 18 months. Certainly, when you think about that international travel demand, because this was my first year. All my friends know this is my first year traveling internationally. Delta, you've had an amazing year and cited that in your most recent earnings as well as one of the catalysts here. How much does that continue to be a tailwind going into next year, people trying to move about the world as well? Yeah, I think it's going to continue to stay strong. Yeah. Obviously, watching what's happening in Israel, what's happening in Ukraine, and some of the, the risks around European travel into the next year, I'd say is something that we're, we're, we're guarded around. But you know, we're not seeing any, any, any reductions sure. in, uh, in anticipated travel. But I think that's the air of caution. But Asia? Uh, China's still not really open yet, and so we've got the second largest economy is still not traveling. So I do think internationally we're going to continue to see strong trends there as well. And you, you talked about that on the earnings call too, with, with the conflict in the Middle East. Um, inbound and outbound flights to Tel Aviv had been suspended through October 31st. Have you needed to extend that? Yeah, well, the... it's on a rolling suspension, and I don't anticipate we'll be flying, unfortunately, into Tel Aviv. For quite a, quite a number of uh, weeks, if not months, uh, you know, it's, it's really going to be dictated by the by the conflict and when it's safe to return. We're ready whenever you know we feel comfortable. Then our crews are comfortable going back in. And uh, boy, it's been a, it's been tough to watch. Yeah, certainly a situation that many CEOs like yourself are keeping tabs on and trying to navigate as best as possible as well. You know, just lastly, while we have you here, and and it's been a year of amazing demand. We've talked about that at length. But when you think about some of the other changes and how you've made sure that you continue to welcome customers, you've got a premium airline, a lot of premium assets here. And there was a, a lot of backlash over the Sky Miles program. You made the changes, but then we're able to roll some of that back. Right. Are we done with changes for Sky Miles? Sky Miles. I, I, I got to know what to tell my parents when I get home for Thanksgiving. Sky Miles, uh, we, we made some modifications mm -hmm. and we modified again. We're, we're good. We're going to stay good for quite some time. And uh, I appreciate everyone's understanding as we went through that period of time. It was tough because we have so many really loyal customers to the airline. And that's what the, that in itself is a bit of the problem is that we have so many loyal customers and strong premium customers. It was putting a lot of stress on the premium assets that we have. So we're in a good spot. We're going to stay here and uh, look forward to seeing you on, on Delta real soon. Well, that's great to hear. And it has certainly elucidated a lot of the customer demand and a lot of fanfare and loyalty that, that the company yeah. and the brand has. Yeah. Ed, thanks so much for taking the time. Brad, good to be with you. Thank Absolutely. you. We're going to take a quick look at the markets, the major averages, plus, of course, the U.S. equity market just opened up cash trading here in the U.S. Let's take a look at the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. Looks like we have gains across the board as of right now, flat as it may be for the Dow. It's still in positive territory by the hair of its chinny-chin-chin. S&P 500, you're seeing that flat, but to the upside, and the NASDAQ composite. That's up by about one-tenth of a percent. We've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Take-Two Interactive shares getting a big boost this morning. Fiscal second quarter net bookings topping expectations, totaling $1.4 billion. But the big focus is on Grand Theft Auto 6, the first trailer of the game set to be released next month. A long time coming for fans of the lucrative franchise. For more on this, Michael Pachter, Wedbush Securities Managing Director of Equity Research, is here with us. We're seeing shares up by about 1.5% right now, so there must have been something that investors like Michael. GTA, a uh, ton of GTA 6 fans. Yeah, I mean, that's really all the, that it was, Brad. Uh, the the print was okay um, in line on revenue, and they beat on earnings, but they didn't pass any of it through. And the guide was actually kind of disappointing. They, they guided sequentially down for the December quarter, which is seasonally usually their best quarter, um, and that implies back up in the March quarter, which is seasonally the weakest quarter. So, uh, you know, that, that implies that there's a game coming, not GTA. And of course, they haven't named it yet. <clears throat> I think the, the biggest problem investors have with Take Two is lack of visibility. I mean, we know all the games they're working on. Uh, GTA came out in 2013. So we've known at least since 2015 that there was a new one coming. But here we are 10 years later, and, and it still hasn't formally been announced. Um, so the stock is not trading on yesterday's print or the hype around upcoming titles. It's solely up on GTA is going to have a trailer early December. They did not announce the name of the game. They actually said a trailer for the next installment in the Grand Theft Auto franchise. So, you know, I'm not sure we're going to get an announcement that day. Um, we don't have a release date. And then the other bad news is management has said for the prior two earnings calls they were going to generate more than eight billion in revenue next year. Consensus this year is about 5.5. So, you know, two and a half billion of growth. The strong implication is GTA is in there, but they won't announce it. Um, and yesterday they said, we might miss that eight billion, but not materially. We'll just be it slightly below. Why? We don't know. So uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. I don't think the game is necessarily coming next year. I do think it's coming the year after. So I'll be pleasantly surprised when they date it and it actually launches. And one reminder, the last time it came out, they announced it in 2011 for a 2012 launch and it came out in September of 13. So they're kind of notorious for slipping on that game. We'll see if it hmm. comes out on time. So, Michael, then what does that mean for the stock price? Because clearly, as we're seeing in the action, like you noted, there is a lot of hype for this release. Is it going to continue, though, to be enough to offset some of that softness that you were just talking about within the report going forward? I mean, the answer is that? the answer is yes. Um, it, I think there'll be some volatility. You know, certainly not 20 point swings in the stock. I mean, 5 percent kind of volatility. Um, it, uh, I expect that, you know, they'll probably get to next quarter and decide to lower numbers for this year because the game that they haven't named yet 
that is coming out in the next four or five months probably isn't ready and gets slipped. Uh, the good news is that piles more revenue into the following year. Um, once they date GTA, the stock's going to rip. Um, if they continue to not date it or if they announce that it's delayed a year, the stock will drop back down 10, 15 percent. I don't think, again, I don't think it makes much difference. With a GTA, the stock is probably worth 165 to 200. I mean, it's worth a lot more. It's trading in the 140s right now. Um, and even higher if they start to execute the way they did on the last GTA, if they beef up Grand Theft Auto Online and that grows from 500 million a year to a billion a year, um, the stock could go over 200. So once it's out there, the stock's going to go up. It's just this uncertainty that they, they refuse to commit to a date. And I don't blame them. They don't want to disappoint investors and say it's coming November 1st, 24, and then, ha then have to announce it's not. Um, they're going to announce it when they're sure. And investors are going to be patient and, and hope and hope and hope. Uh, it's coming eventually. It's pretty close. Yeah, it's almost like GTA 6 was kind of like the Cybertruck button for Take Two in this instance, where we saw Tesla ah. implore that to make sure that the street had something to chew on for a go forward basis here. But uh, when you think more largely uh, across looking, the environment, better right? looking and no risk that it'll kill anybody. So there you go. Uh, That's a very good point. Yeah, that, that is true. That is true. You have a point. <laughs> when you think broadly across the gaming environment right now, we've seen. Finally, the consummation of Microsoft Activision Blizzard. You had Roblox that just in this recent quarter talked about strong third quarter results, continuing platform innovation, growth across all age groups, geographies. And now you get these results from Take Two. Is Take Two living up to expectations right now if they have to hit a GTA 6 button just to keep investors engaged? Uh, Take Two is kind of in the middle of a, a transition from you know selling sixty and seventy dollar premium games to uh, you know becoming an ongoing live services business, and I mean think about that as a movie a movie studio that only makes the theatrical releases and then shifting over to doing recurring revenue from streaming. Um, Activision was already two thirds you know three quarters of the way there. Roblox is a hundred percent of the way there. Um, so, you know, I think that that transition is where the growth is. You're, you're aiming towards the free to play market. Three and a half billion monthly active users play free to play games. And Roblox has 300 million of them. Uh, Activision has 300 million of them. Take two, probably more like 100 million. You know, they're not there yet. Um, they've got to get there. And I think GTA is one of those franchises that people believe in. And they've proven that it, it can work both as a premium game where people pay 70 bucks and as an ongoing live service, which is GTA Online. So I think everybody is looking at that as kind of the, the tipping point for Take Two to really you know, flip over to becoming more than half ongoing live service revenue. And so it's a great investment. Um, I, I actually think you want to buy the guy who's not there yet as long as they're making progress to getting to there. Roblox is trading at a much, much, much higher multiple because it's already there. Yeah, take two shares, moving to the upside today, up another one and a half percent. Michael Factor, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much Thank for you. joining us here this morning. All right, let's head over to our other big mover of the day, and that is NVIDIA planning to release three new chips for China. Now, that's according to a report from the Star Market Daily. The chip maker could announce them as early as next week. Now, this comes following last month when the AI chip giant said that new export restrictions could block it from selling three of its chips in China. NVIDIA has over a 90% share of China's AI chip market. For more on this, Yahoo Finance's tech editor Dan Halley is here. Dan, we're seeing some movement in the stock this morning, up nearly 2%. Talk to us just about what this could mean for NVIDIA's business and maybe offsetting some of the risk that we were talking about just a few weeks ago. Yeah, Sean, I think it's uh, important to point out uh, at, at the jump that this is from, according to Bloomberg at least, a, a state-affiliated uh, uh outlet. So, you know, do it that way you will. But uh, it says that there are three new chips coming. Uh, and that has to uh, basically give a, a boost to what NVIDIA has to uh, potentially offer as far as China goes. They had previously put together two chips that were under the, the 
prior administration's kind of ban on on shipping products to China. Those were the H800 and A800. Uh, and so those were really meant to, you know, from NVIDIA standpoint, say, you know, take the power of those capabilities for those chips down a notch to what uh, the administration's threshold was, and then say, okay, now we can ship this uh, to China. The, the most recent uh, administration moves basically, you know, cut those out at the knee and say, you know, those are still too powerful for shipping to China. Not only that, but it's you know, it's not those just the the, the AI specific chips. Their highest end gaming chip also can't go to China. That's a, that's a big deal in and of itself. Obviously, you know, the the data center side of Nvidia makes more money now. The gaming side was previously its its breadwinner, but gaming is still a big part of the formula there, especially in China. They sell a lot of those uh, graphics cards to China. It's when it comes to gaming, it's primarily a PC market. Consoles aren't really uh, don't really have penetration there. So the fact that the highest end chip can't get there is a big deal. Uh, the margins on those chips are a lot higher than the, the lower end chips. Obviously, it just makes sense. Uh, so that that that's a problem. But the idea that they would have three new chips shipping to China, and and according to this report, uh, it would be coming uh, on the 16th of this month. Uh, so you know that's a big deal for Nvidia of itself. Still being able to play in the China space, uh, you know, uh, Jensen Wang, as well as uh, AMD uh, CEO Lisa Su, they both said that, look, this isn't really going to be uh, uh, impactful to them uh, materially. Um, you know, you got to wonder if if these new chips are going to give them a boost then or if it's not going to be that big of a deal. But, you know, if it wasn't such a problem, then you wouldn't have NVIDIA, obviously, trying to cut down on the power of its chips and then go out and say, okay, here's here's three more that we could potentially sell uh, in China and send send out there. So, you know, I think it, it it's going to still have to uh, get the okay from the administration if it does, um, and then it'll eventually start shipping out there. But this is clearly going to be a, a, an ongoing issue if the administration continues to, you know, put pressure on these companies to ensure that they're not shipping super high end chips to China. Uh, you know, Nvidia is the, the biggest brand in the world when it comes to AI chips. It's not just companies like you know Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon that are trying to get their hands on their their capabilities. It's companies around the world, uh, some that you don't even you know know as regular names. So uh, there's a huge market out there for these. Uh, China, obviously, a huge market for them. So for them to be able to sell in there is going to be a big deal. And if they can get these out there, then you know it's it's something that I think uh, Nvidia obviously wants to ensure they're able to do. Dan, just briefly, does this mean that Nvidia perhaps would not be able to get some of the dollars that are earmarked for and under the, the CHIPS Act, where that's to increase capacity here in the U.S. And, and efforts here in the U.S., does that mean that they're identifying this and saying the, the opportunity is greater if we have something that goes directly into China and we're able to develop something for that market while perhaps not putting same, the same chips in that market and not upsetting the administration here or or risking upsetting the administration uh, and not getting some of that funding. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to say, right, because NVIDIA doesn't build its own chips. Um, TSMC builds chips for NVIDIA um, pri primarily. And so, you know, when it comes to the Chips Act, the idea is really about onshoring uh, chips themselves, the, the manufacturing facilities, the, the fabs, um, mm -hmm. as they're, they're referred to. So, um, you know, I, I don't know necessarily if they're trying to appease the administration uh, by doing this. I, th I think it's just, you know, the administration saying, hey, knock it off. And they're like, hey, all right, no, no big deal. We'll put out some <laughs> other chips that, you know, are under up to your standards. Uh, and so I, I don't necessarily know if it if it's related to Chips Act. Uh, but so many companies have applied for funding through the CHIPS Act because why not, right? Just take a shot, try to get some of that money um, and, and see what you can do. TSMC is part of them, Samsung, uh, Intel. Um, but I'm not I'm, I'm not too sure that that Intel is, uh, sorry, NVIDIA is worried uh, about uh, upsetting the, the Apple cart, uh, you know, with these, these chips to, to China. I think it's more along the lines of ensuring that they can still sell uh, to China in some aspect. And so just, you know, Powering down the capabilities of the chips, maybe uh, reworking them, uh, is mm -hmm. is a means to do that. And solid reminder and good detail there. Our own tech editor, Daniel Halley. Dan, appreciate it this morning. 
We're going to stay in the chips landscape uh, arm, reporting its second fiscal quarter earnings this week for the first time since its IPO with the disappointing guidance that they've also unveiled. The chip company forecasting its current quarter's earnings per share to be between 21 and 28 cents apiece. That's lower than Wall Street's estimates of 27 cents a share. Arm saying its revenue is vulnerable to macroeconomic headwinds impacting the overall industry, but they expect recovery. Not all bad news. The company announcing its highest ever quarterly revenue, raking in over $800 million. That is up 28 percent year over year. Some of the other highlights that the company called out here, particularly the immediate need for companies to increase investment in artificial intelligence and AI across all end markets helped drive license revenue up 106 percent year over year. This is also a company, of course, that changed its model and how its revenue is going to be driven going forward, where they're picking up the revenue on the per use basis uh, of the chips and, and what they're designed for versus waiting for the chip to be embedded within that technology and then picking up the, the, the revenue on the other side of that as well. Yeah, certainly. And taking a look at this release, also just talking about the royalty revenue, saying that they yeah. did benefit here from the market share gains in automotive and also in cloud computing as the latest technologies there, such as R9, really increased penetration across markets, which we know is so uh, cr critical here for ARM going forward. But I think the reaction, obviously, that we're seeing in the stock today, a lot of that is because of the guidance rather than, than the results that yeah. we just got here yeah. for the most recent quarter. We talk about the slowdown that we're seeing here within the mobile market. Obviously, that is going to the smartphone market. That's going to have a real impact on ARM. And then also just some of the uncertainty around the licensing deals going forward, what some of those new deals look like. That's a big question here for analysts. But despite all this and despite that weak guide, it's interesting to me going through some of this analyst commentary here following these results are still pretty optimistic. They're defending their bullish outlook here on ARM going forward. Barclays, one of those saying that the fundamentals still show that the story remains intact. And KeyBank also coming out saying that any weakness of royalties is likely to be more than offset by some of the strength that they will see in licensing here going forward, especially going into the second half. So some important things to keep in mind there. Yeah, hard to say something bad about a company that you were the underwriter for. Exactly. You got you got to say by it at least for right now. Yeah. All right, keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. We got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
the latest retail sales data proves consumers are still spending money despite a higher price tag. Online sales in particular jumped over 1% in September. And companies like Goat Group are looking to capitalize. The online apparel platform released its second annual alias seller report, giving an inside look into the latest consumer trends. Eddie Liu, Goat Group CEO, joins us now for more Eddie Great to have you here with us today. You know I, I try to stay on top of all the latest trends, even if I can't afford all of them. But what are you seeing in this most recent report that gives you a sense of where the consumer is still willing to spend and perhaps where they're pushing back on a few areas? Hey, Brad. Great to be here. Good to see you again. And this year, we're not seeing a major trend like we have in the past with Y2K, for example. This year, for example, we're seeing a lot of micro trends, and one one micro trend is glowcore, which you may have heard of. It's football and athletic retro inspired styles. We're talking about a lot of soccer jerseys being bought on Goat and Grailed. A huge increase in soccer jerseys year, year over year, and of course on the footwear side, really thin profile sneakers this year. Kind of soccer clean inspired sneakers like the Adidas Samba or the Gazelle or even the Onitsuka Tiger Mexico 66, which saw an over 2,500% increase year over year on GoPro. And are you seeing any moderation, though, in terms of how much people are spending on your site or in terms of some of those uh, items that are still selling well? Are they maybe at, some of them, at cheaper price points than other items that, you're, that are also on your sites? What's been really interesting about 2023 is that when we look at our data from our customer purchases, for the purchases happening in 2023, 72% of purchases were for products created and released prior to 2023. So what we're seeing is a huge mix shift in customer preferences saying, hey, there might be a glut of inventory this year, the styles this year might not suit me, but I still am very passionate about sneakers and apparel. And so I'm gonna buy something from years prior, which is mind blowing. I mean, 72% of people are choosing to purchase something that wasn't released this year. Eddie, I have four out of the ten of some of those most wanted items that we just shown on that we just showed on screen. So I don't, I don't know if that puts me on trend or if that just puts me uh, as a consumer who succumbs to very good marketing. At the end of the day, I, I think it's amazing to see where the trends continue to move right now. What, where is the biggest demand, and what are the strongest categorical companies and brands that you're seeing on the platform? Well, of course, Nike still dominates. I mean, the best-selling sneaker for the two years running is the Nike Panda Dunk. Dunks account for about a 26% of Goat Group sales today. So Nike is still dominant. But we're starting to see niche brands that aren't so niche anymore. I mean, you're talking about New Balance leading with the 550. You're talking about Asics and even Solomon. Solomon has grown by over 120% year over year. It's the only triple-digit brand increase that we've seen on group today. So you're seeing that. But also in terms of other micro trends, um, there's something called indie sleeves, right? It goes back to the indie scene back in the 2000s. A lot of skinny jeans and trucker hats. I mean, skinny jeans have increased by over a thousand percent year over year in our app. Eddie, why do you think that Nike brand has so much staying power? Because when you take a look at the performance of the stock, we have seen a bit of a shift just in terms of what consumers are willing to spend on Nike when it comes to direct to consumer. But on your site, why, I guess, what do you attribute that staying power to? I mean, Nike has a long heritage, a great brand, and it's a great marketing machine. And we're seeing that continue to pay for it. I mean, of course, Travis Scott's on tour right now. You're seeing still a lot of hype around Travis Scott sneakers. But you're right, it's not just Nike anymore. In terms of, and I, I live in West LA, the performance running micro trend is huge. Instead of Nike sneakers dominating performance running now, people are wearing hokas, on runnings, um, and the like. Eddie, you have a few different levers to pull. You mentioned Grailed, a business that you had acquired in, in, in recent years. And then additionally, you've got Flight Club underneath of the business. How are you looking at the environment right now among consumers and deciding which levers that need to be pulled in order for Goat Group as an overall in, a business and entity uh, to secure its own margins? Well, for us, the benefit of being a marketplace is the fact that we can really shift to, based on customer demand. So we're not beholden to inventory constraints or requirements from the manufacturer. So we go where the market goes, where our customers go, and our sellers will uh, will figure out that out as well. So another trend we're seeing is that silver, um, for whatever reason, is a very popular color right now. Not sure if it's because of the Beyonce Renaissance tour or not, but 
Silver apparel and accessories are up many thousands of percent on, on GoPro today. Um, and on the other side, um, the color pink has, has gone down. I mean, it had a couple of years of resurgence in terms of the color pink, but right after the Barbie movie, for whatever reason, in Q3, uh, sales of pink products started to go down. So I think for us, we benefit because we're able to move where the customer moves. All right, Eddie Liu, always great to get uh, your perspective there. CEO of Go Group. You have four of the top 10. I do, I, I, Eddie. It's, I've got to step up my game here. Remarkable, man. I'm just, I'm trying to keep up with these Gen Zers. I'm, I'm doing my best. That's a tough task. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Eddie, thanks. What shoes so are you wearing yeah. right now, Eddie? You've always got something fun. Being, being on trend and, you know, growing the, the community, I'm, I'm wearing a pair of New Balance, um, the protection pack, the black colorway. Okay. Do you have those? I don't have those yet. Oh, that must be your next purchase. <laughs> okay, I'm going to send you a link. <laughs> Eddie Lou, always great to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Brad Smith here with Shauna Smith at the NASDAQ market site in New York City. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day, so let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. First and foremost, we've got to take a look at the S&P 500. S&P looking to extend a winning run. A higher close today would mark its longest winning streak since 2004. Where were you when? Let's take a look at some of those individual names. First off, Lyft is still riding backseat to Uber. When it comes to market share, the ride hailing company beat analyst expectations on revenue in the third quarter, but gross bookings are still behind its rival. It grew 15% from a year ago. That's compared to a 31% jump in Uber's business. And Yeti getting a cold reception on this morning while sales were essentially flat in its third quarter amid recalls of some of its coolers. Still, the company boosted its full year outlook thanks to a bump in gross margins. What's in your Yeti? 
<laughs> and lastly, Twilio on the move to the upside of the cloud computing company, raising its guidance for the third quarter in a row as it expects active customer accounts to grow in its fourth quarter. You're looking at gains of just about five and a half percent. Let's turn our attention to politics. The GOP debate stage got personal last night. Take a listen. In the last debate, she made fun of me for actually joining TikTok while her own daughter was actually using the app for a long time. So you might want to take care of your family first. Leave my daughter out of your voice. Your adult daughter. The next generation of Americans are using it. And that's actually the point. You have her supporters propping her up. That's fine. Here's the truth. You're just the easy answer. Clearly a heated exchange with Vivek Ramaswamy criticizing Nikki Haley's daughter's use of TikTok as presidential hopefuls do clash over banning the China-owned app. Now, Ramaswamy himself holds a TikTok account. Posting from the campaign trail, he has defended his use and the fact that he has an account, saying that he needs to be able to connect and court those younger voters. Meanwhile, Republican Senator Hawley renewing calls for a nationwide ban on the app this week, drawing pushback from fellow Republican Senator Rand Paul. 34 states so far currently have either total or partial TikTok bans on state devices, only one, Montana, has passed legislation outright banning the app completely. So, yes, we have seen a lot of heated exchange, obviously, among those GOP contenders. But I think there is a general consensus here in terms of the national security threat that is posed because of TikTok, at least in their belief. Many calls here in order to ban the app. I think the question, though, going forward is not so much what that looks like in terms of them personally, but I think more so the backlash. And we know that this was raised a number of times over the last year and a half or so since we started talking about this, what this could mean for the Republican Party in general beyond just the presidential uh, nominee in terms of the backlash that we could see at the state and local level as well if we do see this nationwide uh, ban because we know it is an app that's clearly extremely popular, especially among the Gen Z crowd. It's been embroiled within, as you were mentioning and alluding to a moment ago, the international business conversation and even the foreign policy conversation as well. But notably, when you think about the next generation of voters that both parties are going to have to make sure that they've got their messaging in front of, make sure that they have connected points in front of, he wasn't incorrect. That is where the next generation of voters mm -hmm. is. However, I don't think that there's the same type of polytalk the same way there is, and that's just me trying to merge together the two terms, the same way we've seen fin talk or fit talk or, you know, all of the other, uh, you know, insert word here, talk. Um, all that considered, I think it's already made waves in previous election cycles, and it's going to continue to do so, and it's only right that some of the elected officials figure out a way to engage with the next generation of voters where they already are as well. Yeah, in terms of some of the other uh, commentary that we got from other GOP contenders last night, Chris Christie saying that it's not only spyware, it's also polluting the minds of American young people. I think you could also maybe make that argument yeah, about some of the social media true. sites uh, from here in the U.S. And also DeSantis saying that it's necessary to address China's role in our culture. So we'll see how this all plays out. It's going to continue to play out. And we're continuing to cover the GOP presidential primary debate on stage. Uh, on the other side of this break with Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman and the Bulwark's editor at large, Bill Crystal. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You got to scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Last night, five Republican presidential hopefuls battled it out in the third primary debate of the 2024 election cycle. Foreign policy dominated the discussion. Participation, all uh, participants all aligned with unwavering support for Israel in its campaign against Hamas, but clashed on China and Ukraine. All five also took swings at former President Donald Trump, notably absent from the event. For more on his takeaways of last night's debate, we're joined by our own Rick Newman. Rick want to get your top takeaways here. Uh, it was tedious TV, uh, as it usually is. If you decided to do something else with your two hours last night, I think you made a pretty good choice. Uh, I mean, you can see all the reviews today. Uh, Nikki Haley seems to be holding up. Uh, she was a hawk on foreign policy. Some of the others were not. Uh, the big takeaway line was, you're just scum. That's what Nikki Haley said to Vivek Ramaswamy after he sounded like he was stalking Nikki Haley's daughter on uh, TikTok. Um, you know, these debates are very hard to watch because there's so much misinformation. Uh, they attack each other on arcane things such as which Chinese company set up shop in which state and which governor Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis actually did something about it or didn't do something about it. If you're watching, you have no idea what's going on. They did talk about the economy. The only meaningful thing anybody said about the economy was uh, let's become energy dominant. That's a new GOP phrase. Um, nobody mentioned the fact that the United States is now producing more oil domestically than it did under Donald Trump uh, or ever. I mean, we're have, we now have hit new record highs of oil production, but nonetheless, uh, all the uh, candidates say we just need we need more fossil fuels uh, and uh, our own Ben Wershkel did have one uh, good takeaway from this debate, which is there was actually substantive talk about what to do about Social Security and Medicare, which are going to run short of money within the next decade. Uh, the moderators did actually pin down most of the candidates on the idea of raising the eligibility age uh, as one reform to uh, those programs. So a little bit of substance. Other than that, just a lot of um, hash flinging back and forth from one candidate to another. All right, Rick, stay with us because we have a lot to talk about when it comes to some of the topics that were talked about during this debate. We want to dive a little bit deeper into what we heard because the boxing gloves were on for the five remaining Republican nominees. And once again, missing former President Trump. Now, DeSantis targeted the former president right away, blaming him for the GOP losing momentum on election night on Tuesday. We also heard from Nikki Haley saying that she doesn't think he is the right president now. Rick is still with us. We also want to bring in Bill Crystal. He's a Bulwark's editor at large and also host of Conversations with Bill Crystal. Bill, it's great to talk to you here. So let's start with some of the uh, targeted attacks that we heard from the GOP contenders when it comes to the language that they use about the front runner right now, former President Donald Trump. What do you think of this strategy? They haven't really been able to close the gap meaningfully when it comes to the leader here. Is that going to help? Is this going to help? I don't think it did much damage to Trump. You said they put on the boxing gloves, which I guess is true, but there, there were a lot of jabs. There were not any big uppercuts or knockout punches, <laughs> that's for sure, against against Trump. So they're still 
kind of intimidated. I very much agree with Rick's substantive analysis of the debate. I would say from a political point of view, from the point of view of how does this affect the actual Republican race, um, it doesn't affect it much, except that there needs to be, if there's any chance of beating Trump, a consolidation behind basically one anti-Trump candidate, non-Trump candidate. And I think Haley has been the logical person uh, for that to be the, you know, to be that over the last few weeks, she's emerged. And I think she continued to last night. I thought she did pretty well. And if you're a pro you pro helping Ukraine, pro understand foreign policy is important, uh, don't like Trump's character. I, I've got to think there'll be more consolidation towards Haley, whether that matters, whether it just means that she loses to Trump, you know, 65, 35 in a bunch of primaries, that's entirely possible. But I think that the in terms of the what I watch for in the next week, two, three, until the next debate is does Scott get out? Do donors move, some DeSantis donors, maybe some Christie donors also move to Haley? And does it become pretty clear that we're going to end up with uh, Trump versus Haley? Hey, guys. Uh, I would add, um, when you ask the question, wh why are these candidates in it, uh, even though Donald Trump is leading by so much? I mean, they have to be thinking... Uh, not just that they want to go one on one with Don with Donald Trump in the primaries, but what if Trump drop drops out? I mean, th this is a non trivial possibility. Uh, he's he's facing four criminal trials. Some of those will be underway and perhaps concluded by uh, pro probably by election day and possibly by the time of the Republican convention next summer. Um, so, what if Trump is a convicted felon in nine months? Um, wh what does what changes about any of these candidates? And that's, I, I guess, that, that is when all of this starts to matter a little bit more. Um, but, the, you know, the question of consolidation, will one of these, will, the, uh, will these candidates all get behind one person? That does not seem to be the case. So going to the primaries, you could have, um, you know, four candidates or five uh, with all these candidates sort of splitting the anti-Trump vote. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, Maybe, Rick. Just, I mean, I think that's a key political question. They could do that foolishly, and then we'll be in 2016 again, and Trump will coast. Uh, Pence has already gotten out. Other minor candidates have gotten out. Will Hurd. I think Scott is out in the next few weeks, actually. And then I think Christie faces a tough choice, maybe after Iowa, when he, he can't win the nomination. He doesn't want Trump to win. Doesn't he get behind Haley? You could end up with Trump, DeSantis, Vivek, I guess he stays in, and uh, just to infuriate the other candidates and, and two thirds of the audience, and uh, and Haley, and that, that I think has a slightly different dynamic. And, and then there is the, some chance that the an actual conviction of Trump in D.C. perhaps in April in, in the trial that's going to begin March fourth on January sixth. Uh, could make a difference. You know, one other point that's kind of amazing to me, though, as a sort of ex-Republican who thinks January 6th was kind of an important day in American history, and, and it says a lot about the, our former president, Donald Trump, who's the GOP frontrunner. January 6th was not mentioned last night. V Vivek had one mention of J6 prisoners, whom he seems to be very sympathetic to, literally not mentioned. So a two-hour debate uh, for the 2024 Republican nomination for president, January 6th, kind of a big deal, since the last Republican nomination for president, not mentioned. So, but what does that then tell us about the GOP party, where we stand today? It says that even the ones who aren't Trump are scared of Trump and scared of mentioning January 6th, because, hey, if you mention January 6th, the question of, well, what happened in the last election comes up? And should Trump be held, have been held more accountable for that? And what about impeachment and conviction in the Senate? And what about these criminal trials? Do you think it's proper for him to be tried for January 6th or for the classified documents or for the other th the state charges that he's up on? It raises a whole bunch of issues that are kind of important for the country, uh, but these Republican candidates don't want to talk about. Bill, uh, what about these recent polls from the New York Times showing Trump uh, ahead of Biden in, in the swing states? I mean, it's a year before the election. Um, what does what can Biden plausibly do to shore up his odds, assuming he is running against Donald Trump during the next 12 months? Look, voters don't want a Trump-Biden matchup, and they're probably going to get Trump, so in a weird way, they take that out a little bit on Biden, and they do think he's too old. They, they don't disapprove. I mean, they do disapprove of some of Biden's policies. They're in an anti-incumbent mood. They don't like inflation, obviously, and all that. But as we saw on Tuesday night, the Democrats match up okay with the Republicans. It's not overwhelming, but Pennsylvania, in a way, the quintessential swing state, a must-win for both parties, I'd say, in 20, a year from now, uh, in a kind of straight-up Supreme Court race, which was basically just a Democrat-Republican, you know, ballot test. Uh, the Rep Democrat won by about five points. So the Democrats are doing okay in some of the key states, Pennsylvania, 
uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, here in Virginia. But um, Biden is, is is not, in my view, the best Democratic candidate. I do think if it were Gretchen Whitmer or Josh Shapiro or one of the Democratic governors running against Trump, they would be have a much safer path to the presidency. But Biden doesn't seem to agree with that, and he seems to want to run again. So we'll test the proposition of whether Biden is a drag on the Democrats or whether at the end of the day, people take a look at Biden and the Democrats and Trump and the Republicans, and you go back to something slightly favoring, more like 2020, slightly favoring the Democrats. But I, I do think those, those it's foolish for people to say those polls don't matter. They don't tell us anything. And final point, the notion that polls a year out don't matter, sometimes they don't if people don't know the candidates. Everyone knows Biden. Everyone knows Trump. They've been president for the last seven years. What what new information are people going to get that's going to move them from their current Trump plus two, plus three, plus four in the swing states? They might get some. They might be reminded again of January 6th. They might be reminded of some things Trump did. But uh, this is like two, to put it in business terms, two very well established brands, right? How many people change between Coke and Pepsi every, in a year? You know, that people have kind of made up their mind about that. So I, I, I think people, the Democrat, my Democratic friends who are sort of saying these polls don't matter, I think that's wishful thinking. Bill, real quick, we're running out of time here, but I want to get your thoughts on the deadline next week. We talk about the GOP party, the likelihood here, the fact that it's still a very divided party, the fact that we could get a government shutdown, no agreement ahead of that deadline next week. How likely is that? You know, I've assumed it wouldn't happen. It just seems so foolish. But I now worry that it could happen. There's more disarray than I realized uh, among Republicans, between the Republican Senate and the Republican House. Could be a shutdown. Could be a continuing resolution for a month or something like that because they can't bridge the gap, apparently, on Ukraine and some other issues. Mm -hmm. But then it could be a shutdown in December. So I'm more worried about a shutdown than I, than I have been. All right. Bill Crystal, Rick Newman, thanks, as always, for bringing down the latest down in the Beltway down in D.C. Well, gold is up fractionally today, but it's been under pressure recently after a brief stint above $2,000 an ounce. Central banks have been some of the largest buyers of gold bullion, which is up 14 percent year to date, according to Bloomberg Intelligence. And for the average investor, Morgan Stanley is saying it's a good time to buy gold stocks. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery, he's got all the details here for us. Hey, Jared. Hey, Brad, let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, where I am looking at gold futures right now, as you said, up fractionally uh, today, but under a little bit of pressure over the last few sessions. Now, this is a two-month chart, and beginning with the uh, Israeli-Hamas uh, incursion war, that fueled a rise to about $2,000 per ounce. And this has been a ceiling historically. I'm going to show you a five-year chart now, and you can see how gold has bumped up against this. This was the first record high, and then we got another attempt here and a third one where we exceeded it by just a tiny little bit. And now we are still in the upper end of that range. However, when we're in a trading range, we have to be careful because it's so it's quite easy to return to the bottom. And I would also note that there was a really nice fake out here in 2022 for uh, gold bears that did not work out for them. Now, I also want to show you some of the largest marginal buyers of gold, not people, but central banks. This goes back to 2010 and shows you how many tons central banks are buying here. And you can see 2022 last year was a record year. We have China buying gold. We have Russia de-dollarizing, which is about a 10-year-old trend. And I should add that this candle right here or this bar right here is only through Q3. So we could easily see See this exceed last year's high, and uh, if that happens, it might be concomitant, commitment, concomitant with a price rise to three thousand dollars an ounce, and that's something that people have really been looking out for. One hiccup. Um, this is a major divergence. Uh, this is a 20 year chart of gold, which is cyan. And you can see that it's right up there by about $1,900, $2,000 an ounce. And then an inverse chart of the U.S. 10 year tips yield. So without getting into the, all the wonky bond stuff, all I want people to realize is that there is a huge gap here. And uh, since this is the in inverse, we could see interest rates fall or gold fall to meet each other in the middle. We'll have to see how that resolves. Uh, but as I said, or as you said in the beginning, Morgan Stanley recommending gold stocks. Um, I was checking with Bloomberg Intelligence. They believe that there is a $150 premium on gold because of the Hamas-Israeli incursion. Uh, that could disappear if things uh, go away. It could increase if things get better. But nevertheless, that's where the numbers stand. So here we are. I was interviewing uh, Michelle 
uh, Mish Schneider a couple weeks ago, and she said if gold finally punches through 2050, easily heads to $3,000. So on that note, I'll close the book here on the other Bitcoin, gold. <laughs> All right, thanks Don't so write much, letters. Jared. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Appreciate it, Jared. Thanks so much. We've got more uh, from the New York Stock Exchange coming up in the next hour. We've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site as well between then and now. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light and space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brooke DePama. Impossible Foods product Beef Light is getting the check of approval from the American Heart Association. This new product joins a list of others on this American Heart Association grocery list like Cheerios, as well as products from Impossible Foods competitor Beyond Meat, which already has products like their Beyond Steak and Beef Crumbles already on the list. Joining Yahoo Finance exclusively to discuss that and so much more is Impossible Foods CEO, Peter McGinnis. Peter, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Brooke. How are you? Doing wonderful. You know, first, let's sort of break down what ingredients does this beef light have that gave it the seal of approval? Yeah, I mean, it's more the nutritional benefits of it. So you're looking at a product that has 75% less saturated fat than the animal product, um, the equivalent right. animal product, and zero, and zero cholesterol, right? And 21 grams of protein. So it's a clean, um, it's a very, very clean product with an awesome nutritional profile. Um, and look, saturated fat in the end of the day is not a good thing. <laughs> cholesterol in the end of the day is not a good thing. No matter who you are and where you're from, no one really likes cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> So. And, and and Peter, many consumers are concerned that these plant-based meats are a bit over-processed. Are you seeking sure. a approval for all your products across the board? Is that even possible? Yeah, of course we're looking into that. I mean, we're listen, I think in the end of the day, Brooke, um there's room for improvement on our products, on all plant-based products. And this is something we're discussing individually as companies within plant-based meat and collectively, right? As an industry and a category, we need to continuously improve our products. The products are good and they're delicious, but they could be better. And I think the less defensive we are about that, um, the better. It's really hard to make a product that mirrors and mimics animal meat. It's not easy um, to make a burger made out of plants that tastes mm -hmm. like a burger from an animal. And so we have to continue to improve our products. We have to view ourselves as food companies, right? And at the end of the day, we make delicious food that's good for you. This got all muddled and mixed and political at times. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say many consumers are still concerned. They want to buy the products, but they are a bit pinched right now in terms of inflation, interest rates sure. being higher, the return of student loan uh, repayments. Are you seeing customers go to other proteins because of the cost? And how are you working to combat that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a little bit of a myth and misconception. It's sort of like processed, right? I mean, you know, the animal industry's thrown out that word processed and it's stuck. And you can just keep saying it over and over again. And some people will believe it. It's made from plants. It's soy that is actually, you know, grown in the ground and, and harvested. And it's made in America, grown in America. The price thing, I think it's more value than price, Brooke. In the end, we've gone down 22% in, in um, price over the past year and a half because of our efficiencies on the production side of things. Um, and the animal industry has gone up 20% because of their input costs are high. Whether that be grain, whether that be trucking, whether that be labor in their plants, very labor-intensive plants. So the gap is tighter than it's ever been between us yeah. or between plant-based and the animal um, industry. And in fact, our products are less expensive than grass-fed organic already. Mm -hmm. So we are premium to what I would call the base ground chuck private label in the well with the saran wrap cellophane around it. But we are less expensive than grass-fed organic animal products already in the last year. So Peter I think it's less about price, than about value. It has been reported that Impossible Foods laid off a number of employees in late 2022, early 2023. Your competitor, Beyond sure. Meat, just recently laid off some of their employees. How do you see this going forward? Do you do you um, plan to announce another round of layoffs? In addition to that, Impossible Foods has long lost value since 2021. Do you plan to raise another round of capital? So two great questions, Brooke. One is I don't plan to do a you know company riff or anything like that i think look a lot of these plant based companies got ahead of themselves there was incredible excitement around the plant based industry and a lot of the companies got ahead of revenue and invested way ahead of revenue 
So some of this is just a correction. So what I did last year is in the end of the day, to have a sustainable mission, you have to have a sustainable business, gross margins, EBITDA, um, your cost line in, you know, in line with revenue. So yeah, we did do some restructuring last year. And, and so that's the first piece. The second piece is we're well capitalized and there is no need for a raise or liquidity event right now. Um, and so we have no debt and we're well capitalized from a cash perspective. So we will eventually um, do something, but there is no pressure to do it, which is a really unique and good place to be. <laughs> Peter McGinnis, industry. Impossible. <laughs> Absolutely. Peter McGinnis, Impossible Food CEO. Thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Brooke. Good to see you. Take care. Good to see you. More on the other side of the break on Yahoo Finance Live. Stay tuned. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
Edgewell Personal Care saw sales dip slightly in the fiscal fourth quarter, but it does see sales rising 1 to 3 percent in fiscal 2024. Now, this comes amid macro headwinds and a shift in the consumer. Now, the maker of Schick Razors and Banana Boat also announcing plans to strengthen its operating model and double down on supply chain efficiency. Let's talk about where things stand with Rod Little. He's Edgewell Personal Care, a CEO. Joining us now with more Rod, it's good to see you. Let's take a step back and talk about the macro environment, right? Right now, for your company, consumer facing company, obviously very reliant on spending trends. What are you seeing? How challenging is the macro environment? Yeah, good morning. Uh, good to be here. The, the macro environment for us right now to this point, the year we just finished, has been good. Um, we've seen a resilient consumer, and our quarter four just finished in our fiscal year, um, grew at the same rate the past 52 week trends have been. And so we've seen that low to mid single digits, depending on the category uh, of growth. And we've seen it very consistently across the world. We've had good growth here in the U.S. in our categories and as well as Europe and in Asia. We've seen growth in the categories. So broad based growth, the consumer's been healthy. You know, from here, I think there's a question and, and maybe there's a concern on where the consumer goes from here. Uh, but it's been remarkably resilient to this point. Rob, where do you see the consumer going from here? Yeah, I'm not a great predictor. I, I read a lot. I, I see the the views of, of the or maybe some there. of the trends that you're noticing just in yeah. terms of what people are spending on within your business. Yeah. The one thing that does concern me is we've had some excess uh, income in the market. Right. And that's come out in terms of the savings rates and, and what people had a year ago. There's just less excess there. And I think with uh, student loan repayments coming back on, there's just net less from the consumer, at least domestically here in the U.S. And so, I, you know, the thing I look at is um, for us is shift to private label or shift into lower uh, price point products within our portfolio. And we supply private label. We're the private label leader in shaving, for example, here domestically in the U.S. And we've got brands that value oriented price points all the way up to the higher end of, of the pricing ladder. And we've not seen any meaningful shifts to this point uh, from consumers trading down in our categories, whether it be shaving or sun and skin care. Um, but that would be the first thing we'd watch is would we start to see consumers shift down into that private label area? Um, but we're not seeing that. You mentioned student loan resumption and payment resumption there. To what end are you modeling for that in your forecasts right now? And I mean, is it real that we're going to see people say to themselves, hey, I got to repay these student loans now so I, I can't shave this week or I can't put on can't put on that suntan lotion? Yeah, I think, Brad, it's just, it could be one of many things um, that impact the consumer, right? It's not just a singular event, I don't think, but that's one that could provide a little bit less disposable income um, throughout the week. But, um, you know, it, as, as I look at it and I look at our products, um, as the consumer gets pinched, they're either going to trade down or use products less often. And so, you know, for us, we've modeled a range of sales growth of 2 to 4%, a midpoint of 3 um, if we get similar consumer behavior that we've had the last year, the last six months, we'll be more in that three range. If the consumer does start to trade down or become impacted and, and have consumption drop, that pretty puts us more in the 2% range. And then obviously, if we execute well and, and the consumer is really healthy, then we're up north of three into that 4% range. That's how we thought about bracketing our guidance range for the year ahead. Rod, one of the uh, notes, the highlights that you guys went over in your earnings call that caught my attention is the fact that you say that you're better positioned in terms of supply and demand as well as inventory levels. On the inventory front, more specifically, what do those inventory levels look like in terms of how much excess you still have on some of the shelves? Yeah, so for starters, we think inventory at retail is very balanced and in very, very good position. So I don't know of a country category combination right now um, out there that has any meaningful oversupply of inventory at retail. And we've made some adjustments at retail in the last fiscal year just finished. Japan, most notably, where we reduced retail in the trade significantly. It had three points of growth impact in our quarter four at the total company level on the change we made in Japan. So that's behind us. So everything is very clean uh, at retail. With our own inventory supply, um, we are seeing a stabilized demand picture, longer forward looks on predictability, 
and we have very good um, stability within our manufacturing plants. And so we're in very good balance. What that allows us to do now actually is to reduce inventory and convert to cash quicker as we go throughout the year and exit this year, where we think we can actually take 10 inventory days out of what we're holding and effectively get us back to a more normalized position uh, dating back to pre-COVID. And so we've been running above average inventory to hit service and fill rates with our retail partners. And we just think we can do that now with less inventory going forward because things are more stable. Rod, just lastly, while we have you, as you kind of look across your wholesale partners and for many of them who have had to track what Shrink is doing to their businesses and how that's showing up into some of the brick and mortar retail, we've seen additional friction points in order to reduce Shrink, but at the same time, the, you know, either wave to have one of the associates come over or just the plastic casing, that, that is a friction point that companies like yourself have to consider. It, it, has that had any p impact into sales to, to the extent that you could see thus far? Yeah, it is a friction point, and it's a very good call out. Uh, unfortunately, we were leading edge, uh, particularly with razor blade cartridges, as, as you call out. We have had razor blades at, at, at various retail points be under lock and key for many years. So this isn't new for us in our primary category of, of razors and blades. Um, we've been under you know, lock, particularly in the drug channel, uh, for many years. So as, as I look at it, as we see it, the impact to shrink to us in our categories is not, there's no noticeable or meaningful change versus a year ago or two years ago. It's certainly a problem. That's why our products are locked down at retail in many cases, and you do have to get an associate to go get you the product. But that's not new for us. That That's always been there. Well, good thing is when I'm in the aisle, I still need that razor in order to shave. Rod Little, you who's the edge too, personal Thank you. you know, thanks, man. I'm trying my best out here. You know, got to stay kind of smooth as the baby's bottom, as they would say, whoever the proverbial they are. Appreciate it, Rod. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Morgan Stanley's wealth management arm is being probed by the Fed on whether they do enough to prevent rich international customers from laundering money. Now, that's according to a report by the Wall Street Journal. The report says that the Fed has been scrutinizing the bank on how it vets foreign clients before taking them on as customers starting in 2020. Now, Yahoo Finance reached out to Morgan Stanley for comment. They have declined to comment for now, but within this report here from the journal, they're saying that Andy Saperstein, who oversees this division, he has met with Fed officials and promised to rectify any shortcomings. Another crackdown here from federal re regulators when it comes to bank processes, exactly what this could do for the business. The impact that this could potentially have on Morgan Stanley, I think, is also a focal point from analysts from the street today, from investors. It could potentially lead to higher costs. And then, of course, what this means for Saperstein right now in terms of the fact that he oversees this division. Yeah, absolutely. Shares right now are down by about one and a quarter percent here on the day where they've been in the red throughout the trading session and over the past two days down by about seven tenths of a percent. All in, though, you have to think about for the consumers and the, the customers, particularly within this part or this division of the business, how that can impact perhaps even the net promoter score because there you're getting into some of the wealthier clients who have more word of mouth even because they want to see results at the business that they're doing, uh, the bank that they're doing business with, and that's helping them with some of that wealth management practice. Um, and at the end of the day, this is perhaps not, <laughs> well, it, it is not the best instance um, in that effort effort as well to maintain a positive net promoter score on that front. So we'll continue to track that as the Fed has introduced this probe privately that is now public, uh, according to reports here. As we wrap up our time, though, this morning, we're marking the end of an era on behalf of the entire Yahoo Finance team. We want to give a huge thank you to the NASDAQ for playing host to us for the last few months here yeah. as we renovated our studios, which you will see us in beginning next week here as well. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Obviously, a beautiful background, beautiful studio. Nice. We really thank the team at the NASDAQ for welcoming us with open arms as we did have a few weeks here to bridge between our old studio and what will be de debuted on Yahoo Finance on Monday morning. Yeah, just a few of the guys, the names who have been encircling us behind the scenes, uh, we might add. You don't see them, lot them. here on camera. Camera, but they are like a pit crew for NASCAR in between breaks, especially when we are kind of changing around the set for interviews. Steve, Jim, Ron, Rich, Zeph, uh, we certainly do appreciate all of the hospitality that you have been able to provide for us and uh, a seamless understanding of what our show needs and being yes. able to help us execute that as we well. We will miss them. Yeah. Maybe we'll be back. You never yeah. know. Hey. All right, let's do a quick check of the markets here before we go to break. Again, all three of the major averages in the red this morning of the Dow off just about 66 points. The NASDAQ just below the flat line. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Jared Blickery has you for the next hour. We'll see you on Monday.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Jared Blickery. Here's what I'm watching today. A strike no more. Actors have reached a tentative three-year deal with studios to end a nearly four-month strike. So where does Hollywood go from here? And Traeger's 25% jump in revenue from last year is doing little to calm investors as the stock plunges. We're going to speak with the company's CEO later on in this hour. Plus, battle of the weight loss drugs. AstraZeneca is making its play in the space on the heels of Eli Lilly's FDA approval. But as more companies make moves, who stands out to come out on top? But first, let's take a look at the markets here. A little bit of a down day in the markets. We can actually mix. We see the Nasdaq exactly at break even. Been ticking down about one point. S&P 500 down seven tenths or seven basis points actually, and the Dow down a whopping 45 points. Those long streaks. S&P 500 up eight days in a row, and the Nasdaq under a little bit of threat here. And now let's go to the bond market as well, where we can see the 10-year yield, uh, and we'll get a print on that. It dipped below 4.5 percent, but is now at 4.56 percent. That is a rise of three basis points from yesterday. The 30-year clocking in at 4.7 percent. Well, moving on, the main story of the day that we're going to pull up here, uh, we do have the Hollywood strikes are officially over after 118 days on the picket line. SAG after has reached a tentative deal with the studios. Specific details of the deal are expected to be revealed when the agreement goes on with the union's board on Friday. Here with what the potential new deals mean for Hollywood is Yahoo Finance senior reporter Alexandra Canal. Ali, the details, please. Hey, Jared. Well, this is certainly a big deal for Hollywood. Six months that this industry has been out of work, if you include the writer's strike, which officially ended last month. The actors, though, they've been really holding out for a solid deal. And it seems like they got it from the language that they released. In a statement, they said that they were able to get a lot of the protections that they were fighting for. One of the big sticking points in the negotiations particularly surrounded the role of artificial intelligence and making sure there were more protections for actors when it comes to AI. Uh, so I got after also wanted to make sure that they were able to see some form of payment when it comes to super successful streaming shows. The union said that the contract is valued at over $1 billion and does indeed include those AI protections, along with the streaming participation bonus and above pattern minimum compensation increases. We also are going to see substantial raises to pension and health caps, along with increased pay for background actors. But like you said, we won't see the specifics of that deal until the union board officially approves it, likely tomorrow. But this all comes at a very critical time because now there's still time to save the broadcast season. There's still time to save the 2024 summer box office season, although we have already seen the impact there with multiple theatrical delays. In fact, just minutes after sag after approved the deal, Sony Pictures pushed back the third installment of its Venom franchise from July 2024 to November 2024. And this follows other delays like Paramount's upcoming Mission Impossible film, along with Warner Brothers Dune sequel. And then if you just think about the overall economic impact, that's been incredibly significant. Both of these strikes are estimated to have cost the LA economy $6.5 billion, along with 45,000 jobs in the entertainment industry. So there's certainly been a lot of pain heading into this, but hopefully now these actors can get back to work, the studios can get back up and running. It's certainly a happy day in Hollywood. Ali, and now the hard part comes uh, backfilling all those missing episodes and movies that we've been waiting for. Thank you for that report, Ali Canal. In Disney's fourth quarter earnings call, the company's interim CFO, Kevin Lansbury, said they plan to reduce annualized content spend by four and a half billion dollars. CEO Bob Iger also saying they plan to dial back a bit, that's a quote, and focus more on a few big moves. Could some of that pullback be seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? The media giant bought Marvel Entertainment for four billion dollars back in 2009. As of 2021, Forbes put a value on it at fifty three billion dollars. The Marvel Marvel Cinematic Universe has become a box office juggernaut, grossing almost $30 billion worldwide over the last 13 years. So sounds like a good investment, but is the profit still outweighing the cost? The next film in the franchise, The Marvels, premieres at midnight and box office projections are putting the opening weekend at about $60 million domestically. This would make it one of the lowest performing movies in the series. 
The cost to put it out, that's about $320 million. And earlier this week, Variety reported on a series of troubles for the Marvel Universe, including declining box office numbers since Avengers Endgame, trouble with the production of the upcoming reboot of popular vampire Hunter Blade, and the impact of legal troubles surrounding actor Jonathan Majors and scrapped scripts from new Disney Plus series Daredevil. So, is Marvel still the moneymaker Disney needs? Or will a pullback be part of the company's $7.5 billion cost-cutting efforts? Joining me now is Joanna Robinson, author of MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios. Uh, Joanna, Anna, thank you for joining us here today. I had the opportunity to peruse your book, and it is a thick tome, over 500 pages. Uh, can you just give me some of the highlights here of what an incredible backdrop this story has been? Uh, what was it like writing it for you? Yeah, this was an amazing project for us. Um, my co-authors, Dave Gonzalez, Gavin Edwards, and I worked on this for close to five years. We started in 2019, right around when a little independent film called Avengers Endgame came out in theaters. Much different time for Marvel and its public perception and what its brand was doing at the time. We spent, this was like our pandemic project. We spoke to over 100 people, and we really wanted to tell the story of Marvel Studios from soup to nuts, from its origins, which involves a lot of really complicated and densely contracted business deals to its current state. We were writing this up through the summer, up until the last minute, new, new twists and turns kept happening in the Marvel story, and we really wanted to present a complete picture of it. Well, let's go back to the soup and the soup to nuts, the very beginning. I'm always interested in stories like that because, according to your notes, Marvel began as a shoestring indie operation, and they financed some of the studios by mortgaging the film rights to 10 of its characters. Uh, can you tell us some about the early days that we might not know about this, uh, about this series? Oh, yeah, the Merrill Lynch deal, which is one of my favorite business deals of all time, where a business genius called David Maisel, who was the original president of Marvel Studios, negotiates a deal with Merrill Lynch for $400 million. And in exchange, he's leveraging the rights to characters like Iron Man, ever heard of him? Captain America, ever heard of him? Black Panther, ever heard of him, et cetera, et cetera. All these heroes that they had not yet made any movies about. And he had to convince Merrill Lynch that these heroes who weren't very popular in the comics had to convince them that they were worth that much money while also convincing Marvel that it would be no big deal if they lost the rights to those characters to Merrill Lynch if they didn't pay back the money. But pay, pay it back they did in spades. The first Iron Man movie was a smash hit and the investment paid off very quickly thereafter. I am a huge Tony Stark fan myself. I want to go back nice. to the beginning uh, with the, of the Disney acquisition, 2009. Uh, I wouldn't say they bought it for a song, but compared to the 50 plus billion dollars it's worth now, uh, quite cheap on the uptake. Can you give us some insight as to what went on during those initial days of the negotiation and then the, uh, the, constant, and then the contract itself as it was signed? Yeah, I think what's fascinating about what Disney was after at the time is Bob Iger, uh, the then and now head of Disney Studios was really looking to diversify their portfolio. They had the corner on the princess market, but they were looking to acquire these various studios like Pixar, Lucasfilm, and Marvel to sort of make sure that they could appeal to all different kinds of audiences. And uh, Though Iron Man was a big smash hit, they didn't yet know what something like the Avengers would do. The Avengers happens after the Disney deal is, is put into place. And so that changes the value of Marvel tenfold at the very least. Well, let's talk about um, diversity in movies here. Uh, according to some of your notes, and this is repeated throughout the book, Marvel Studios had to fight to release movies that were featuring women. And in, in one particular example, you say studio president, uh, president Kevin Feige was almost fired when he insisted the Avengers movie should feature Black Widow. What was, and it's difficult to think now because I think of these movies as being so intertwined with female characters, but what was it like back then in the initial days on the upswing? I think it's it's a great conversation to have around the release of the Marvels this week, this movie that's led by three female superheroes, to remember that at the beginning of Marvel Studios, 
there was this fight between Marvel West Coast, which is Kevin Feige and all of his filmmakers, and Marvel East Coast, which is Ike Perlmutter, who was the head of Marvel Entertainment, and all of his cronies over there. They thought about these stories in terms of what could sell toys. Uh, a phrase we use in the book that I love that we got from one of our interviews was push plastic. They're trying to push plastic. Okay. And in Ike's point of view, the people that push plastic, the action figures that people want to buy, are superheroes played by white guys named Chris. Like, that was sort of the brand for a while at Marvel. And Kevin Feige and his filmmakers were trying to get movies like Black Panther made, trying to get Scarlett Johansson, her Black Widow spinoff, trying to get all these things made. And Marvel East Coast was saying, that's not going to sell toys for us, so we don't want to do it. And eventually... Marvel Studios is making so much money hand over fist for Disney that Iger had to step in and sort of broker, push Ike Perlmutter out of the org chart, essentially, and have Kevin Feige report directly to them. And that's when we got Black Panther. And that's when the floodgates sort of opened on really changing our ideas of what a superhero could look like. Yes, and let's expand on that a little bit because we think of, or at least I think of Marvel as a global phenomenon now, uh, but it wasn't back in the day, and there was some risk expanding internationally. China was a bit of a surprise, as I understand, um, yeah. surpassing expect expectations in that country. Can you tell us about the international push and some of the surprises and maybe disappointments along the way? I think one of my favorite chapters in the book, honestly, is our China chapter. It's sort of intertwined with our Iron Man 3 story that we tell. If you've seen Iron Man 3, there are multiple cuts of that movie. There's the American cut, and then there's the cut that came out in China, because at the time, Hollywood was experimenting with how much to pander to the Chinese audience, to the Chinese government, to the Chinese censors, and they would insert Chinese characters actors or celebrities into their movies in order to make a certain threshold so that they could open in China. The Chinese box office opening up for Marvel was a complete game changer in terms of the box office numbers. And eventually you start seeing it's not just million with an M, it's billion with a B is what these movies are pulling in. The first Captain Marvel movie makes more than a billion. Black Panther makes more than a billion. Infinity War, Endgame, that is all contingent on the Chinese box office. Post Endgame, which is a story that a lot of people are really interested in right now, what happens to Marvel post Endgame, post Endgame, they start bumping up against problems with the Chinese censors because of some of the more progressive stories that they want to tell, whether it's gay representation or the outspoken politics of some of the actors or directors who are making the Marvel movies. China blocks Marvel for several years, and that has a huge impact on their bottom line. I have about a dozen more questions for you, but unfortunately we have to leave it there. Really appreciate you stopping by with all your insights and congratulations on the books. Joanna, author of MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios. Thanks so much for having me. Well, AMC, it was great having you. Switching gears, AMC shares are plunging today on news the theater operator chain uh, excuse me, filed to offer $350 million of stock. Company said it plans to use the proceeds to boost liquidity and to pay or refinance debt. This comes after AMC reported third quarter results that beat analyst expectations thanks to the success of uh, summer blockbusters Barbie and Oppenheimer. Company also said it expected to continue to see increased traffic as concert films by Taylor Swift and Beyonce should benefit theaters in the fourth quarter. AMC has been selling stock to help pay off its debts, those debts it accrued before and during the pandemic. And then to allow it to continue to do so, the company completed a reverse one for 10 stock split over the summer to reduce the number of outstanding AMC shares. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back. Apple may have to pay a $14 billion tax bill to Ireland, and that's after advisors to Europe's top court has come out and said the case started well way back in 2016 by the EU antitrust chief commissioner should be re-examined due to legal mistakes. Let's bring in now Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley to give us all of the details. Dan. The details. That's right, Jared. This goes back to uh, as far back as 1991 and 2007. That's when uh, Ireland had some tax rulings regarding Apple uh, and the entities that operate there uh, with regards to taxes. And so uh, they had a decent tax rate going there, pretty favorable to Apple. Uh, in 2016, uh, the EU antitrust chief, uh, Marguerite Vestager, uh, Vestager, basically said, Look, uh, we're going to take a look at what's going on here with Apple's taxes. In 2020, uh, Apple and Ireland, uh, they went ahead uh, and uh, had a, a court decision go in their favor, basically uh, saying that the tax rulings were okay. Uh, they don't have to pay back these billions of dollars in taxes that uh, the, uh, the European Union had said that they do. Now, though, uh, there's an advocate general uh, in the EU who basically is able to look at cases and then provide a, a non-binding uh, recommendation. So what's happened here is this non-binding recommendation says that basically the EU and Apple have to go back to the drawing board uh, and relook at the original cases uh, regarding these taxes as to whether or not Apple does actually have to pay the EU uh, billions of dollars uh, in back taxes or not. Again, this is non-binding. It doesn't mean that this actually has to happen. It's a recommendation. Uh, so the idea that Apple is officially on the hook for anything just isn't the, the, the truth. But uh, there is a risk now that the EU could go ahead and take that uh, advice and actually try to uh, kind of relitigate what's going on with the taxes there. And this has been a, an ongoing issue for the company and Ireland. Uh, you know, there's been discussions as to whether Ireland provides overly favorable tax rates to companies like Apple uh, to get them to operate within the country, obviously drive up jobs, uh, as well as, you know, through construction, as well as people who actually work for the companies themselves. Uh, so this is going to be something that's really worth watching for Apple going forward. All right. We thank you for that report. Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley. Moving on here, the S&P 500 looking for its ninth straight day of gains. A higher close today would mark its longest winning streak since 2004. Earnings season is pushing on as investors eye key reports from major retailers like Walmart next week. Here to break it all down is Jay Woods of Freedom Capital. And Jay, really great to have you here. I want to uh, go to the Wi-Fi Interactive where I'm showing the S&P 500 over the last six months. Now, we actually dipped down. I was interested to see that over the We actually went to the unchanged line after six months, but we are rocketing back up to these October highs. And meanwhile, the 10-year T-note yield has just dropped like a stone from the 5% mark to the 4.5% mark, facilitating these moves. What are you seeing in the technicals? And I'll go back to the S&P 500 here. Yeah, we, uh, we were under some pressure. We tested some key levels in, in a nice bull market rally, gave back about 10%. These are normal, healthy corrections. Uh, had us a little jittery, but it was all driven by the 10-year, as you showed. And the 10-year spike got a little too far ahead of itself, and uh, it's finally corrected. It hit that 5% threshold. It was like, okay, we got to get it there. We got it there. We're pulling back. Now we're watching 4.5%. Uh, yeah. There should be some support here at 4.5%. If it breaks down below there, then I think this rally can continue to have some legs. But given the speed of which we rallied off the low, how many yeah. days in a row is it, it now? It was uh, eight, nine, nine. Yeah, going back to 2004. I, I remember. That was actually uh, the beginning of a nice little rally rally higher. Uh, could that spell this is actually the beginning of the next leg of the bull market? We'll soon find out. Uh, but right now, given the recency of the rally and how strong it's been going from oversold to overbought, a pause would be due. Um, and, and I expect us to kind of digest these gains. And that's what's been impressive about this rally is mm -hmm. how we haven't really given back anything. Um, and uh, the buyers are still, you know, the dominant force. And if we can hold and then break above 4,400, then uh, the next six weeks should be strong into year end. Yep, 4,400, the level everybody's watching. Want to move on to Apple here. Um, this is a huge bellwether. It looks like we were kind of in a negative trend channel here as I'm going on the Wi-Fi Interactive. Might have broken through. Depends on how you want to uh, draw the lines. But what are you seeing in the most important stock in the solar system? Yeah, I, and your lines were fine, Jared. <laughs> With a finger, that was quite impressed. It's, it was in an intermediate downturn trend, making a series of higher lows and lower lows, and uh, we finally broke out of it. Uh, just like the S&P, you can mimic the S&P 500. It's the same 
chart. Uh, Apple, the most important stock in the world, just like Microsoft, makes up a little over 7% of the S&P 500, and it's doing the heavy lifting that we needed to do. Uh, the earnings, you know, we, they were a little mixed. Uh, the, the China reports had people a little skittish, mm -hmm. but it's been able, the price action has been able to lead us higher and break out of that intermediate downturn trend. So what do I think it's going to do from here? I think it's going to make another run at 52-week highs. Uh, we see it in Microsoft at all-time highs. Yeah, uh, there's there. nothing right now to say Apple can't continue this run into year-end and close at 52-week highs. And if Apple and Microsoft are making 52-week highs, all-time highs, uh, it doesn't get more bullish than that. I want to move on to uh, some earnings. We got Walmart and some other retailers. Walmart, by the way, as you noted to me, uh, just coming off a record high. This is a six-month chart. Let me just go to a one-year. Uh, consumer staple, perennial uh, staple in people's portfolios. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen next week? Well, uh, all-time highs are very bullish, and the fact that this is leading. Now, th this is the one sector that you have uh, a mishmash of, of stocks. In fact, Walmart, Solid uptrend. Mm -hmm. Home Depot trying to reverse. It's kind of neutralized. Possible inverted head and shoulders yes. uh, pattern developing there. And then you have Target. Target's been the one that's been beaten down. Uh, Target, from a risk-reward setup, is actually looking good to me. It yeah. looks like we have a little floor in Target, um, and uh, it's trying to reverse. And any positive news, kind of like a Disney today, two totally different animals, but price action is similar, uh, and that's why I would compare the two. You may get to see a nice pop and, and a quick reversion to the mean, and given how much Target has been beaten down, oh, I could goodness. see that rally. Here's a five-year. You can see that right here. I don't know what the percentage yeah, is, but and it's palpable. When in doubt, back it out. So you look at the five-year. In Disney, you look at a 10-year chart, and you saw that 80 held. Um, and what are we seeing? We're seeing a nice little mean reversion, nice good reaction to some positive news, and, and Target hasn't had too much of that. So uh, that one of the three intrigues me the most, but Walmart, uh, there are a lot of stocks on this new high list, and it's starting to expand, and you're seeing the cream of each sector. You see it in Hilton, in the leisure uh, sector, making new highs when the others aren't. Cardinal Health, uh, Eli Lilly, these are stocks, look at that Cardinal Health, yeah. that's a beautiful little rounded this bottom, a nice breakout. This is a year to day, wow. Yeah, and uh, you know it may have gone a little too far too fast over the the near term, mm -hmm. but these pullbacks would be very attractive to buy. And over the long term, this is the leadership within the sector. Now, will it carry the rest of the healthcare sector? That's the million dollar question. Yes. I think going into year end, these stocks will lead us, and we'll see it in cybersecurity next week when Palo Alto uh, they come out with their earnings. They traded higher the last ten quarters after earnings. Let's see if they can make it eleven. Good uh, stuff there. Yeah, and, and look at it. Uh, uh, we're not at 52-week highs just yet, but Palo Alto can lead a lot of these cybersecurity names that have been kind of been middling. The one that comes to mind uh, would be, um, why am I blanking on you, Jared? Oh, well, Cloudflare. Cloudflare. Uh, Net. If you have, look at Jared, you're the man with these charts. <laughs> uh, yeah, Cloudflare is a stock that's been basing, and Cloudflare had good earnings themselves. But guess what the catalyst for that to break out is going to be? It's going to be Palo Alto. So if Palo Alto does well, look for stocks within the sector to, to make a breakout. And we could have a run to 75 very easy in Cloudflare. And then if you back it out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this stock could be could be breaking out of a longer term pattern and has a lot to reverse. These are the setups I like. So the risk reward setup for a, a Cloudflare symbol NET, that's why I couldn't remember because the symbol isn't the same. Uh, but we, we have some way to go and then we got to touch Bitcoin here. We got less than a minute. What do right. you think about this latest rally? Well, clearly earnings came out and spot, it broke out of a base. Spot Bitcoin ETF. What um, more do you need? Yeah, well, the spot Bitcoin ETF news is what's driving it. Uh, right. If it gets approved, I'd probably sell it because that it's one of those buy the rumor, sell the news. But the only way I look at Bitcoin, our firm doesn't dabble in Bitcoin. Uh, it's nothing that we cover. But for, as a technician, it, the price is the only thing that pays in Bitcoin. And, and we had a breakout. a lot of price history in here. The, the price history is telling, and it has room to run. It just broke above 30000 That was a line in the sand for a while, mm -hmm. got right to 35000 The next target, it pulled back, it consolidated, broke out, and it broke out in a nice way. Uh, 44000 45000 the speed at which Bitcoin can move, uh, not only is it a target for that level, it could get there quickly. I'm talking by the end of the year. Uh, that's a nice return, but like I said, with Bitcoin, 
have stops in place, be very careful trading it. Um, it moves and it trades 24-7. Lots of fake outs too, especially on the weekends. So. Yeah, yeah, and who needs to be trading on the weekends? I know you Bitcoin traders will be there <laughs> watching it, but uh, I, I'm from this building here and we close on the weekends. I don't like to look at things, but make sure you have limit orders, stop orders in place because the moves can continue to happen to the upside and it looks good. Jay, really appreciate you stopping by here. Jay Woods, Freedom Capital Markets Chief Global Strategist. All right, the U.S. Census Bureau came out with projections this morning saying the U.S. will reach a peak population of nearly 370 million people in 2080 and then see continuous decline if there's no additional support from immigration. The U.S. population has been steadily falling since before the COVID pandemic, though there was a small uptick in the number of births between 2021 and 2022, where we went from 3.66 million to 3.67 million. However, the latest data from the U.S. Census Bureau shows that by 2029, those aged 65 or older will outnumber children under the age of 18. Around 2038, it's 15 years from now, the U.S. will begin likely to see more deaths than births annually. The data takes into account the major impact that immigration plays, projecting that it will continue to be the largest contributor to population growth in the years to come. But neither climate change nor unexpected catastrophes like wars or pandemics are considered. All your markets ac action is right ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance. Two major consumer-facing companies, Krispy Kreme and Oatly, dropped third quarter earnings before the bell this morning. Krispy Kreme missed expectations while Oatly posted mixed results. Here to join us with more insight is Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma. So let's talk about Krispy Kreme first. D-Nut is the ticker. What do we have going on there? Yeah, Jared, let's kick things off with Krispy Kreme. This was Mike Tattersfield's last call as CEO. Josh Charlesworth is set to take the helm on January 1st as CEO. Now, some top takeaways was, of course, pumpkin spice was yet again another successful limited time offerings. But we also saw success with their partnership with, I guess you could say, influencer Haley Bieber around her strawberry glaze lip, uh, peptide lip treatment, insomnia cookies. They're also seeing strong levels of interest there after the company said that they were exploring strategic alternatives. They acquired Insomnia Cookies five years ago, and they said that they have been able to strengthen 
their e-commerce and digital platform because of it. And lastly, another huge takeaway that many investors have their eye on is Krispy Kreme's ongoing partnership to expand or rather their um, potential opportunity to expand their partnership with McDonald's here in the U.S. It's currently at 160 locations in Kentucky. Incoming CEO Josh Charles with did share more on the call about what they've learned so far. Take a listen. Ongoing analysis and discussion with them, covering the operational execution, making sure the donuts uh, uh, always uh, arrive at the right time, uh, right quality, um, uh, understanding then indeed are uh, uh, the requirements that would be needed to, to scale beyond beyond Kentucky and, of course, commercial viability uh, of, of the whole thing. I mean, our confidence in the U.S. DFD opportunity, uh, including now QSR, is, is what's grown. Uh, it's such that we've decided to thoughtfully start making additional investments. And deliver fresh daily, that DFD model is something that they've implemented in recent years in order to ensure that consumers get those fresh donuts daily. An analyst did also ask about the potential impact of weight loss drugs. And they said that because of Krispy Kreme's infrequent uh, customers, they rather infrequent purchases among customers, they don't seem too worried about any potential impact there. And Brooke, before we move on, just want to go to the Wi-Fi Interactive where I have Krispy Kreme D-Nut on screen and we can see uh, that 9% drop today, still up 18% mm -hmm. year over year, but want to put a max chart on where we can see pretty choppy since its IPO in 2021. And then moving on to Oatly, which is getting a pop. Well, you can see that's down 97% from inception. Year to date, it is down 63%. What is inside the earnings of Oatly here? Yeah, Jared. Well, investors are really weighing on them simplifying their supply chain here. Perhaps that's why investors are, or rather we are seeing that pop here today. They said that they're going to double down on their asset light production strategy. Now, what that means is they're actually discontinuing the construction of new manufacturing plants in EMEA and the Americas. They found that ways to service the growing demand by expanding capacity in their existing facilities. They now plan to relocate and already are relocating some equipment that they previously purchased for some of these. They said they're going to be able to have a better focus by simplifying and streamlining their supply chain and reducing the complexity. Now, in addition to that, they did say that they see ample opportunity to grow here in the U.S. outside of their home and in food services. Of course, we're seeing many coffee shops as well as bigger names use Oatly products within their stores, but they did admit that they're seeing a, a lower growth rate that's not as strong as they would have liked, but they really are focused that eventually consumers will shift to oat milk at home. Thank you for that report, Brooke De Palma. Moving on, grill maker Traeger out with earnings after the bell on Wednesday. Grill sales showed a steady comeback, jumping 45 percent year over year, even as consumers under pressure pulled back from bigger ticket discretionary purchases. Let's bring in now Traeger CEO Jeremy Andrus for more. Uh, look, can you just give us, and thank you, by the way, for joining us here today. Can you just give us a big picture overview of your earnings and what you think this means for investors? Absolutely. Uh, good to be here. So first of all, we, we had a solid quarter. Uh, sales grew 26 uh, percent over the prior year quarter. Uh, EBITDA grew from negative uh, 13 million dollars uh, to positive 4.7 million dollars. Uh, and we saw uh, meaningful growth in our gross margin. Uh, it, it grew, uh, expanded thousand basis points uh, over the prior year quarter. So it was a good quarter. And, and I would say it was a quarter uh, marked by discipline in a challenging environment. I mean, if you think about where we've come in terms of, um, you know, the market for high ticket consumer discretionary uh, products, uh, high ticket durables, uh, it's it's been a challenging market since post pandemic. And so as a team, and I'm really proud of the team and, and, and how the team has dug in and said, we're gonna be disciplined. Uh, we've, cop we've cut up X. Um, meaningfully, uh, we grew sales 26% in the quarter, grew up X 1% in the quarter. So there's a lot of good things going on around the P&L, around the balance sheet. Uh, inventories come down meaningfully this year uh, from uh, north of $150 million 
to uh, to about a hundred million dollars at the at, at the end of the quarter. So, you know, we're grinding through a tough environment, being disciplined so that we can drive EBITDA, but also ensuring that we can prioritize the right investments that allow us to drive growth in the future. And you mentioned the challenging environment here. You have a window on the consumer. And uh, before you IPO'd in 2021, you were still operational and you were getting to see uh, people go through uh, all kinds of remodeling at home. Uh, people were making large discretionary purchases and now they've pulled back because of this challenging environment. What's your read on the consumer right now? You know, it's a good question. Um, you, you know, it's interesting when you, when you read the consumer headlines, uh, it speaks to a robust consumer who is continuing to spend. If if you if if you if you pull that apart a little bit and and you look at the category that we play in, and if you zoom out and look at just broader uh, high ticket durables that trended during the pandemic, uh, we certainly saw some pull forward demand, and I think all of these uh, all of these categories are recovering uh, from some extent. But it's also uh, consumers, American consumers are used to financing uh, what, what almost everything. And so you think about interest rates, there's certainly an impact from, from a consumer financing perspective. Uh, but we sort of look at this category and say, you know, Americans grill, they always have. And, and actually the market for American households uh, who grill grew during the pandemic from 75 to 76 million households. And so, you know, there, there, we, we, we saw some volatility. Consumers overbought during the pandemic. And at some point, uh, we'll get back to more, more normalized replenishment cycles. And we'll see sort of this steady market where uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a slow grower, but Traeger is a grower, a disruptor, and a share gainer. We're just sort of navigating a window uh, that's very different um, than the one that we were in two years ago. Yeah, you mentioned uh, financing from the consumer. We actually have the Affirm, C Affirm CFO after the break here, but I want to stick with you. We are coming up on Thanksgiving, the busiest retail, uh, I guess, holiday time of the year. What kind of products are you planning to release? Any specials? What are your plans for the holiday retail buying spending spree season? So, so uh, we love the holiday season. Uh, un unlike the traditional grilling industry, which tends to be more seasonal, we do really well during the holidays, not just because of gift, uh, because of gift buying, the best gift that you could buy, uh, of course, uh, but because consumers actually use this product year round. Uh, they cook their turkeys on it, their lamb, their, their ham. And so uh, this is a product that does well during the pandemic. I'm sorry, during, during the holiday season. Uh, but, but, but to be clear, the engagement of the trader community is still very small. It's st still very, very strong. You know, we are seeing consumers continue to cook uh, at very impressive rates to engage with the brand. Uh, we're seeing our social media grow meaningfully, uh, up 20% in terms of total followers uh, since last year uh, in the third quarter. And so we sort of look at this community that's still very strong, very passionate, and we're coming into a holiday season uh, that, that's typically been a great moment for us. Thanksgiving is a great moment for us. I was uh, in LA a couple of nights ago at a Friendsgiving event with some, some really interesting chefs and influencers. And so this is a moment for us. Uh, our consumables are, uh, are performing well. Pellets, of course, it's a fuel and flavor for the grill, um, but rubs and sauces. And so we, 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 like where we, we like the investments that we're making in the business. We love this strong engagement that's, that's continuing. And during this moment, we're going to drive energy during the holiday season because our consumer is listening. All right, we have to leave it there, but best of luck to you in this holiday season. Traeger CEO, Jeremy Andrus. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance.
AstraZeneca announcing a partnership today and rejoining the weight loss drug market. The pharma company is paying China's Ecogene about $2 billion for an exclusive license to develop an oral GLP-1. Yahoo Finance reporter Anjali Kemlani is here to break down all the details for us. What are the details of this deal? Well, Karen, I'm so glad you asked. It's an interesting deal. So they are dealing with a China-based company, that's Ecogene, and they are going to upfront pay $185 million for this. And then it, the deal in total includes up to $2 billion, like you referenced, for everything from continuation the, uh, continuing the trials to getting to market. Now, they do have ex AstraZeneca gets the exclusive global rights uh, for everywhere except China, and that's where they're going to be co-producing uh, and co-marketing the product. This is AstraZeneca's re-entry into the GLP-1 race. Uh, they did already have to back out and terminate two other products in their pipeline earlier this year uh, for poor results. So this is their re-entry, but it also marks uh, the second day that we've gotten uh, positive or rather promising GLP-1 news really starting this race in this field for this new generation of the drugs. We got news yesterday about Eli Lilly getting their Monjaro approved uh, just for weight loss use. And so they're doing it as ZepBound. So that really has, you know, some impact on what we're looking. We know we've been, uh, you know, tracking this market. It has a lot of promise, a lot of revenue, a lot of demand behind it and this is just going to be another option now the oral part is the key to this though for astrazeneca because it is the thing missing in the market right now they do have injectables only available with these two lily and novo nordisk Wigovi product so this adds to the list and will it is part of what the next generation is there are other oral glp ones as well being developed so the race is certainly on Yes, and AstraZeneca down 5% year-to-date has a lot to do to catch up to Eli Lilly, up 63%. Thank you for that, Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kemlani. And tune in this afternoon. AstraZeneca CEO Pascal Sorio will be joining Yahoo Finance at 3 p.m. Eastern. A firm shares are skyrocketing today after seeing revenue jump 37 percent year over year as it narrowed its losses in the first quarter. The buy now pay later company also saw transactions climb 28 percent from last year, citing accelerating growth in its debit card. Michael Linford, a firm CFO, joins us now with more. Uh, Michael, thank you for joining us here today. Could you give us uh, an overview of these uh, earnings and stats that we're just throwing out here? Yeah, we, look, we're taking share in a growing market. Our revenue grew 37% year on year. Our GMV, as you mentioned, grew 28%, which was three times the pace of e-commerce growth in the quarter. And we did that while posting really strong unit economics. Our revenue, our revenue less transaction costs as a percentage of GMV was at 3.8%, which, you know, for us, we always talk about wanting to be in the three to 4% range. And so we're near the high end of our long-term range uh, despite the macro backdrop that folks have been talking so much about. And we were just talking with the Traeger Grill CEO in the prior block. He mentioned the desire to uh, buy now, pay later. Uh, but overall, consumers are spending a bit less on these expensive dis uh, discretionary purchases. I'm wondering what trends you're noticing in the buy now, pay later space. Yeah, we saw really strong results in, in categories like general merchandise, as well as continued strength in travel and ticketing and experiences. Um, and yes, the, there's clearly pressure on the consumer in some categories, but that's what makes our product so important. Everything that we do for consumers means more in this kind of an environment. And we're able to do that today. And I think the reason why you're seeing that strong demand um, on the GMV side is because of the, the, the macro environment. Oh, and your stock is up to a 52-week high today that I was seeing in the charts. Want to talk about credit and delinquencies. We've seen those on the rise. Uh, there, are, there are some concerns that this could be a predecessor, a prelude to recession. But what are you seeing in the delinquencies here? And what do you think that means going forward for your business? Our credit results were really strong. Um, we, our delinquencies declined 30 base points year on year. And you're seeing us stand in stark contrast to the credit card banks out there who are seeing continued credit deterioration. Um, we have a structural advantage in how we go about underwriting. 
we, we take the world's best machine learning and data science applications and apply them to, to what we think is a real advantage in transaction level underwriting. And you're seeing the, the benefit of that really play out right now. We're able to control delinquencies exactly where we want them to be. Our credit outcomes, as I've shared on this program many times, are something that we control. And you're seeing us control them right now. And what's really impressive is we're doing that while still growing really quickly. And I think that um, is a little bit inconsistent with I think what a lot of the preconceptions were about us. I want to zero in on the machine learning that you just mentioned there. I take that to mean artificial intelligence, AI. Correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but how, how does, this impl how does uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, allow you to operate your business more efficiently? Are you uh, filtering consumers? Are you just optimizing the offers, the interest rate? How does that work? Yeah, I think the AI moniker has become a bit of a catch-all. We've, we've always talked about the data science and machine learning approaches and we, we always stop short of, of trying to claim that we've got artificial intelligence in our business because these are really sophisticated sure. models that are highly effective, but they fall short of some sort of artificial general intelligence, which others are certainly working on. Um, we do use the large language models for productivity inside the firm, and we think there's a lot of opportunity, just like any other enterprise, to bring the benefit of some of these really cool innovations to how the enterprise operates. Um, but our underwriting approach hasn't really changed. Our underwriting approach remains uh, one where we consume data from the consumer and the, and the credit bureaus and apply it to the underwriting um, problem in a way that's predictable, legal, and, and explainable, which is so important in our industry. And I want to talk about the macro environment, arguably the most challenging in 40 years. Uh, not a lot of investors around who were experiencing rates and inflation as high as we've seen recently. How do you adapt to this and what does this mean for your business going forward? That's a great question. I, I think this last quarter is, is really a good example of what we say, what we, what we do means more in this macro environment. We are, we are more valuable to our merchants, to our consumers, and importantly, our capital partners. Um, we are finally getting credit for the credit outcomes that we've been driving in the debt capital markets. And that perception has allowed us to continue to be focused on growing the enterprise. Um, if you think about what we do, we help consumers get the things they want and need without needing to go use revolving credit accounts. And we can do that in a way that controls credit outcomes. Um, and that's why you saw us post the really strong unit economics we did last quarter. The past year has been one where we focused on getting our units in shape. Um, we certainly had to do a lot on the pricing side of the world and feel like we got through that in a way that's really powerful which sets us up to be very aggressive at continuing to further our mission. We, we feel like we've earned the right to, to refocus on continuing to scale the enterprise right now. All right, well, congratulations on your quarter and uh, we look forward to having you back. Uh, maybe when delinquencies are actually rising, Michael Linford, a firm, a firm CFO. All your markets straight ahead, you are watching Yahoo Finance.
Virgin Galactic plans to pause spaceflight operations next year to focus on its next generation of space travel. The company also laying off roughly 18 percent of its workforce to decrease costs and realign its resources. Cuts are projected to save the company roughly $25 million annually. With six successful space flights completed this year, the company significantly trimmed its net losses during the most recent quarter and doubled revenue. With more on the company's path forward is Yahoo Finance's Ines Ferre. So, Virgin yeah, Atlantic Jared, on pause, uh, the Fed's on pause. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, look, you are, you're right. I mean, uh, look, we are in a high interest rate environment and we are seeing space-related companies that are cutting costs. And in this case, Virgin Galactic, which we have followed this stock really since they went public via SPAC back in 2019 and so much enthusiasm about this stock really and the future of space travel. And we have seen also short sellers pounding onto this stock. So part of what you are seeing today, that huge spike that you are seeing in that stock price is likely a short squeeze as you are watching the stock up 27 percent. But look, the street is positive about its revenue guidance for for the fourth quarter, that revenue that's expected to come in at three million. Prior to that, the target was one million, and estimates from analysts was for 1.5 million. The loss per share was less than expected for the for the third quarter. And Virgin Galactic is going to be pausing its flights for in mid 2024 up for the Unity spacecraft. And this is an important point because the company is now shifting towards its Delta spacecraft, that's its newer spacecraft, which will be able to hold 50 percent more passengers and travel twice a week and help the company reach profitability at a faster pace. Jared. All right. We've got to take another name here in the space uh, realm, and that's Rocket launching space grabbing. Excuse me. This is a uh Astra Space. Astra Space is a company that went public via SPAC merger back in 2021, but a string of failed launch failures have dragged on the stock since. Now, its founders, they may have a new plan to go private. What are the details here? Yeah, that's right. Its founders are now saying that they are offering to take the company private by buying it, the outstanding shares at $1.50 per share. Now, you'll see that the stock price is right now at around one twenty something per share. Keep in mind that this stock was at $185 a share back in 2021. The company went public via SPAC in 2021. I would say that that was the height of these space-related companies. But as you had mentioned, it's struggling to obtain cash. And look, in this higher interest rate environment, we are going to see this. These space-related companies are very capital intensive. These projects require a lot of money, a lot of tests, a lot of challenges going forward, Jared. Yeah, Astra Space down about 99 and change, 99% and change. Thank you for that, Yahoo Finance's Ines Ferre. All right, let's do a final check of the markets here on the Wi-Fi Interactive. And we started the day in the red. It looks like we have a mixed market right now. The Dow is down a whopping six basis points. Let's track the interday price action. Hasn't spent too much uh, time in the green, but it's down 20 points now. S&P 500 up eight basis points. And the NASDAQ up a, walking, a whopping 25 percent, or excuse me, 25 basis points. This is going to do it for Yahoo Finance's broadcast. Make sure you check us out later. We have an AstraZeneca CEO interview up at 3 p.m.